Dr. Ingram, um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. So um, I'm not sure if you have my slides. If not, I can share, but it says that I can't at this point. <laughs> We're working on that and uh, should be able to share them shortly. Okay, all right. Well, good afternoon to all of you. Um, oh, there they are, that's great. So I'll just, I guess, let you know when to um, uh, move the, the slides forward. But um, good afternoon, it's great to be with you. Thanks for the invitation to talk to you this afternoon about um, some of the work that has been done, not just in my lab, but also some collaboration that we have done with um, folks at uh, mostly the University of New Mexico, but people have moved around a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about um, characterizing water out on the Navajo Nation, um, mainly unregulated water sources. And so you'll see in a few slides why that is important. So next slide. So before I get started though, um, my work is done in um, Northern Arizona in um, our, our university is located in Flagstaff. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, my university sits at the base of sacred mountains to many of the Native American groups in the region. And uh, we're just very blessed to be um, in the place we're at. So next slide. And then I did wanna give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself in the Navajo language. So Yate, She, Jani Ingram, Yunashe, Na'anish, Jeji, Tachini, Nishle. Bilagana Bashachin, Kitlachini Dashiste, Bilagana Dashitnali. So um, in in many indigenous groups, we introduce ourselves and kind of find those um connections. So I don't know if there's any other Diné or Navajo folks in the group, but um, maybe I have some relatives um, who are listening today. So I was born and raised off the reservation in Kingman, Arizona. My parents, my mom is on the Navajo side. My dad was um, a white person. Um, if you want to go back really quick. And um, in addition to being um, a, a daughter, I'm also a wife and um, a mother of three kids. And that really does help inspire some of the work I do. So next slide. So in addition to having bio, biological kids, I have um, what I call my chemistry kids. So there's students who have worked in my labs over the years, um, honestly, from very different walks of life, many native students, but also non-native students. So these are just some pictures of, of my students over time. So next slide. So I'm gonna talk to you about work out on Navajo Nation. So in Navajo, it's the Neh Bekeya. And it's in located, the Navajo Nation is located in the Four Corners area. It is a very large landmass, the largest um, landmass reservation in the um, United States. It's 27,000 square miles, which they say is about the size of the state of West Virginia. You can see some of the facts there when, when the reservation was actually established in, in 1868, and then that it became a sovereign nation in 1923. Um, and so you can see the different colors um, of those regions and those are called agencies out on Navajo and I will be referring to them a little bit later, but you can think of those as kind of states um, within the nation and then the boundaries, you can see smaller boundaries. Those are what are called chapters. So there's five agencies or states and then 110 chapters or counties. And these are really community areas in which um, much of the work is done. So you can see there is you know, quite a bit of, of um, area to cover, but we, and I'll talk to, to you about some of the water work that we've done um, really all over the Navajo Nation. So next slide. So a little bit more background. So like I said, Diné is what the Navajo call themselves, it just means the people. It has approximately, the, the nation, there's about 400,000 um, citizens who are enrolled members, and about half of those folks live on the reservation. Um, you can see some of the um, socioeconomic statistics in this slide, um, but the thing I wanna focus on is just really the infrastructure issue. Um, it's estimated that 20 to 30% of the households out on Navajo 
do not have running water or power. So therefore folks are, are need to haul water from different water sources. And so we're gonna focus a little bit on that with this talk. In addition, um, folks still do a lot of ranching and sheep herding out on Navajo. So it is a very rural um, lifestyle that folks have. So next slide. So um, focusing on the water issues. So um, there is, like I said, many of the homes do not have running water. And so as a result, then people need to haul water. Other issues out on Navajo are that it is a very arid climate. There are water right issues. So sometimes, you know, things change very quickly. Um, definitely drought is a problem. And, um, and so people haul from different types of sources, including um, what are called uh, livestock wells or non-regulated wells, just meaning that they do not have, you know, regular um, testing and there's no filter systems because these wells were really intended for the livestock. However, um, Navajo is, is vast, it's very big and very rural. And so um, oftentimes the most convenient water source is one of these livestock wells. So um, cost is a huge burden to the Navajo people who do have to um, haul their water. So as you can see, just an estimate, typical cost for a water user in urban areas who have tap water is about $600 per acre foot of water. Whereas if you are um, having to haul your water, um, this, this goes up by a factor of 70. So this is really an expensive um, issue. And then later in the talk, I'm going to <laughs> talk a bit how the COVID pandemic actually um, affected all of the, 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 the water insecurity issues. So next slide. So these are um, pictures of different types of water sources that folks might use out on Navajo. So you can see um, the windmill with the big tank. And so sometimes there's a trough that you can hook up a hose and then, um, which is shown in the bottom right corner hook up a hose and be able to, um, you know, haul your water that way pretty easily. But sometimes it takes having to climb up on, onto the tank. So that can be an issue. Um, there also are um, hand pumps and, and some of the, um, like shown at the very top right corner is a seepage site. So you'd have to dip down into the water. So there it's, there's different um, of these unregulated wells. It's, it's, you know, for the for the people using them, they need to know what they're getting into, whether they need um, hoses or whether they need a ladder to get up to the top of the tank and those types of things. So next slide. So to compound issues, um, there was um, uranium mining out on Navajo in the mid 1900s. Um, this was, you know, really the uranium boom started after the approval of the Manhattan Project in order to, um, you know, get uranium for um, military uses. So the mining activity was, there was a lot on the Colorado Plateau because the ore there was enriched in uranium and which is where the Navajo Nation lies. So um, as a result, there was a lot of uh, waste, including radioactive waste, because uranium is radioactive. And then the Navajo people, you know, since that time have had serious um, health concerns as a result of these abandoned uranium mines. So next slide. So shown here is actually uh, a, another map of the Navajo Nation, but now kind of showing you the mining regions on Navajo. So the X's on this map are abandoned uranium mines. And there is um, about 532 of these abandoned uranium mines scattered across the Navajo Nation. And then there's also um, additional mine features where there was presumed you know, attempts to mine that area that just never really resulted in ore being extracted. So as a result, these, these abandoned mines have left behind um, mine tailings the there was different approaches to the mining so in the western part of navajo um that was open pit mining so just taking the ore from the surface 
whereas in some of the other regions, it was underground mining. So all of these have different um, uh, mine waste issues. As of, you know, currently only a few of them have been remediated. So most of them were just left behind. Um, and so there are questions as to what all this mining activity um, affects the, the water sources on Navajo. So next slide. So some of the policies that dictate, you know, cleanup are, are shown here. So the first one is US EPA Superfund program. Um, and that has been just more recently been able to apply to some of the areas on Navajo. Um, part of the Superfund criteria is that you need to have um, a certain population density in areas that need cleanup. And Navajo is very rural. People are very spread out. And so that has been an issue in the past, but it seems that there are been made um, the ability for those super fund uh, uh, funding to be able to go to uh, working on some of the remediation. It's very, very slow, but there does seem to be a little bit of action, which is, is encouraging. Other um, uh, approaches to the policy were the Uranium Mill Tailings Radiation Control Act, UMTRICA, and then the Uranium Mill Tailings Remedial Action, UMTRA, um, which you know, really oversaw some of the issues, but the, there was very little remediation that happened through those acts. And then the last one I wanna bring up is actually out of the Navajo Nation called the Diné Natural Resources Protection Act of 2005. And this was um, put forth um, by, the, by Dr. Uh, Joe Shirley's administration it really based on the Navajo fundamental traditional and natural laws and essentially saying that there should be no more mining on Navajo for uranium. So next slide. So I'm going to talk to you about um, a couple papers in particular that have come out from my lab. Um, so back, I, I came to NAU in 2002 and in 2003, I started this work looking at, um, in particular, water and water issues out on Navajo, knowing that um, folks were hauling from unregulated sources. There was um, the Army Corps of Engineers had gone out and done some testing across the whole Navajo Nation. Only one sample was collected and then analyzed for various potential contaminants. But that that initial work was really important in helping to see, yeah, there seems to be an issue out on Navajo with some of these unregulated wells, in particular with um, uranium and arsenic um, elevated levels. And so we have been sampling water and doing analysis since 2003 in my group, um, really working very closely with the community in terms of you know, what wells they wanted tested, where these wells are located, and then a very critical part of what we um, do is then to give that information back to the community. So um, we've really learned a lot about how to both dialogue with the community to understand the issues, you know, do the actual work, and then providing that information back. So the two pubs I'm going to talk mostly about today, um, the first one is was published as first author Jonathan Credo, who was actually, this was a lot of his undergraduate work, um, at this point, uh, Dr. Credo is a double doctor. He just finished his MD PhD and is off to residency, but still works quite a bit on this work. And then the other um, paper was from Lindsay Jones, who did a master's with me in environmental science. So I'll talk about those. Um, next slide. So this is, uh, again, another map of the Navajo Nation. This one is pretty busy. But what I'm trying to show here is um, the wells that our lab has um, collected water and done analysis. So the yellow stars um, all, along this map all show um, different wells that we have collected water over the years. Um, I think there's um, almost 300 wells shown on this map. In addition, there are some of the wells that were um, uh, reported, you know, the, the the chemistry from the Army Corps of Engineers, which are in green, 
Uh, blue is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and then orange is the US EPA Protection Agency. And then superimposed on the map is just dots that kind of are trying to represent, you know, some what you might call hot or or high levels of, in particular, uranium. So I know it's very busy. It's kind of hard to pull all that information out. But this is just to show you um, the, the ge geospatial look at all the wells that my lab has looked at. So next slide. So in the publication, um, uh, Dr. Credo showed um, the, the results from 21 different elements that were analyzed by inductively coupled plasma mass spec. Um, about 300 water samples were collected um, and every site was um, collected. We collected samples at least two different times in order to understand better um, the consistency of the, constant, the, the wells, um, as well as just making sure that if we saw a high value is that truly what it was. And so we wanted to do duplicates there. And so what you can see is a list of the 21. I know this is a very busy table, but essentially he reported this in terms of a well, the maximum concentration in micrograms per liter, the minimum concentrations, if it says BD, that just means it was below our detection limits, the average value, and then also the medium value for all of these elements. So next slide. Another thing that he way he reported this was to um, provide the numbers of wells that either were above um, the maximum contaminant level, which is the drinking water standard um, from EPA. Now, again, these are livestock wells and they weren't meant to be used by um, people. <laughs> However, they are used by people. And so that's kind of the reference point that we use in our lab to at least say, you know, does this seem elevated? Is this a well that we should probably let the community know? It is above the drinking water standard. So, you know, it'd be a good idea not to use it for drinking. So what you can see is just a, a subset of the elements. So arsenic is first, uranium is second, followed by vanadium, magnesium, or manganese, calcium, and lithium. And so what he showed here was that um, the number of wells that were above the drinking water standard. So you can see, um, this might be hard if you don't know Navajo, but these are different agencies. So Chinle is sort of in the center. Um, Fort Defiance is a little bit more to the east. Shiprock is to the north and Western is to the west. Um, and so wells that, the number of wells that were above the drinking water standard for arsenic, for example, the ones that were approaching, meaning that they're very close to the drinking water standard, and then those that were below but detectable, and then those that were below detection. And so you can see there's variety. <laughs> um, you know, some of the, for example, again, looking at arsenic, um, the Fort Defiance Agency has the most wells that are above the, ars uh, the drinking water standard for arsenic. So there, again, Navajo is a very large landmass, and so there's variation in the drinking water or in the water um, sources across the nation. So next slide. So this is a way that we typically provide information back to the communities. And so this is a bar graph where you have the concentration on the y-axis in micrograms per liter or part per billion. And then on the x-axis are the different samples that are collected. This is just um, taking a few from each of those areas across the nation, but this is a, a good way to provide information back to the community because what we do is we, the horizontal line is that US EPA maximum contaminant level or the EPA drinking water standard. And so we can tell people if, if that bar is above that line, that means it's really not safe to drink. And so you can see, you know, depending on the region, for arsenic, the, the maximum contaminant level is 10 part per billion, and for uranium, it's 30. And so you can see there's, you know, various wells have um, exceedances, so to speak. And so this is just a way to be able to, you know, provide this information back to the communities. So next slide. So I'm going to now switch gears a little bit and talk about Lindsay Jones's work 
where she looked, she took a much deeper dive into wells in Western Navajo. So this region was mined uh, mainly using open pit mining uh, procedures. And a lot of it was in more of the Southern part of Western Navajo. So you can see the um, X's that again, um, designate the abandoned uranium mines. And so they're mainly concentrated down in the South in the Cameron and coal mine communities. Um, the black dots on this map show all the different wells that um, were sampled, at least, you know, again, probably closer to three times each throughout um, Lindsay's uh, master's work. And she looked at a total of 82 unregulated water sources. So next slide. So what she did with her data was to develop these um, risk maps. So what you can see is a map um, for the risk in terms of arsenic and the other in terms of uranium. And so again, the, ac the X's on the map are the abandoned uranium mines. And so the, the dots show essentially the risk as you move from um, very small risk. So that would be the small sort of yellowish circles all the way to the very dark reddish brown circle. So going from below two parts per billion all the way up to as high as um, 235 parts per billion. And again, for both uranium and arsenic, things are really focused in the Southern part of the, um, the, the Western agency which is where the mining took place. So that, you know, that does make sense. There is one well up in Lachi, so in the more Northern part of Western Navajo that does show um, high levels of uranium and to some extent arsenic. Um, recently, I met a community member from Lachi and we are going to go back up and um, do some more sampling in that area because she was, she was very surprised and it is a bit of an outlier, but we want to you know, investigate that a little bit more. So next slide. So in order to provide this information back to the different communities, what Lindsay did was she put together a um, booklet. And so that's what's shown here. And essentially the booklet had the information that she collected and what she did was on the um, one page of the booklet would be the map of the chapter or the community that she collected those um, samples. So that's what you can see in the top um, right is the loop chapter with the, the um, where those, those wells were located. And then on the other page facing would be the information of, that she collected in terms of uranium and arsenic for those wells as well as a summary of what she found. And so that's shown in the bottom right. And so the reason she took this approach was because many of the wells have designations or, or names that were given to them by whoever um, actually dug the well. In many cases, it's the um, Indian Health Services or IHS. So for example, you can see 5T-529. Well, the community doesn't call the wells that. So they might call them Auntie's Well or something like that. And so what we wanted to do was geospatially show it so that it's on the map and people can say, oh, that's that's the well we go to. So it makes it a little bit clearer where these wells are and who is accessing them. Um, and then in addition to that, the summary or the, the, the data that's reported like I said, we found it's pretty useful to use these bar graphs and to put the maximum contaminant level um, uh, information on the map. So there is the dashed line and the solid line, the solid line being for arsenic. So bar graph, anything above that tells the person this is not good, you know, as far as drinking water. And then the dashed line is for uranium. So she did this for every chapter that she um, collected data. And then she also took these booklets to the chapters and really gave an explanation of what she found and then left behind these booklets for folks to be able to provide to their neighbors if they weren't able to go to these sort of report back meetings. And so we got pretty good feedback that people really liked this because they both had 
something in hand to take home and then it the information seemed pretty um, understandable. The last thing is that um, I had a, another student in my group at that time who had very good Navajo language skills. So she actually did some summaries of different um, of some of this work in Navajo for Lindsay so that again there is a, a little bit of information you know within the Navajo language for people to look at. So next slide. So I want to end the talk just with some of the collaborative work that we've done with the University of New Mexico. So these are a couple papers that were published um, out of uh, Dr. Johnny Lewis's group, um, really looking also at air, um, arsenic and uranium um, issues from these unregulated water sources. So the reason why we got together was because as you can well ima imagine, University of New Mexico is on the e more on the eastern side of Navajo and uh, Northern Arizona University is on the western side. And so we had data sets that really covered a bigger area of the Navajo Nation, thinking that if we combine them, we could perhaps actually provide information to the tribe about the entire Navajo Nation. So next slide. And so we began working with uh, Dr. Lewis's group back in 2018. At that point, um, Joe Hoover was a postdoc in her group, and we worked with him and with uh, Daniel Bean, who was a master's student, student and, and my students to collect or gather all this information and to try and combine them in one large database so that it had information where you know, it was very similar and easier to find, um, you know, what, what one might be looking for. So next slide. So in addition to our, the, U, the NAU and the University of New Mexico data, we also collected any public data that we could get our hands on in order to add to the database. And so this is just showing all the different sources of uh, data that we were able to, you know, find and, and use in this overall database um, in order to try and build out um, all the different or as many of the different unregulated wells as possible. So next slide. And so this shows um, really there was over a thousand water sources and as many as 158 analytes. Now, not every single um, uh, triangle that's shown here, those are the different water sources, has all 158 analytes, but as many as we could collect and put into the database. And so um, these water sources included primary drinking water standards. We looked at secondary drinking water standards, different water chemistry, some radionuclides, and then some other analytes and measurements such as pH and turbidity and that kind of thing. And so all of this was combined into one big database. You can see that there's parts of the nation that are very well um, uh, represented by all those black triangles. And then you can see there's other areas that seem sparse. Definitely there are um, livestock wells or unregulated wells in those areas. And so um, at this point in time, um, Joe Hoover, who's now at the University of Arizona, he and I have made it a goal to try and get in, um, get permissions or approvals from those different communities to collect water so that we can complete, um, you know, the, the information across the Navajo Nation. So next slide. So um, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that the COVID pandemic and water insecurity kind of are going together. So out on Navajo during the pandemic, at one point, it had the highest rate of COVID infections per capita in the whole nation. And so it was terrible. It was a really terrible, terrible thing for the whole you know, world, but definitely out on Navajo, it was a, it was a major problem. So next slide. And so how this impacted um, the water insecurities was that um, because it, the pandemic was so terrible out on Navajo, there was a decision to have um, lockdowns on the weekends and um, curfews during the weekdays for people living on the reservation, which meant that they, on the weekends, they were supposed to be home by 5 p.m. 
Friday and not leave their homes really until Monday morning early. And then for during the curfews, those were two people were supposed to be home, I think by five o'clock. So if you don't have water in your home, it made it really difficult to go to your normal um, water you know, site that you were hauling from. And so it became a really big issue for folks out on Navajo. So next slide. So this is just showing you um, a map again of the Navajo Nation where there is water insecurity and where it's it's very, very difficult. So the darker the shaded area, you know, the more homes that do not have the, the you know, piped water into their houses. And so you can see, particularly on Western Navajo, this is a, a major problem. So next slide. And so um, we, Again, my group, University of New Mexico, had built this database in order to really provide to the Navajo Nation. We finished it about in 2019 and boom, the pandemic happened. And so we were able to, you know, use that information and work with other folks within the government to really build this website called Navajo Safe Water. And it, it's, it's a website that takes this information, puts it you know, geospatially on the map of the Navajo Nation so that people can better understand different places that they could haul that perhaps they hadn't hauled from before, but to know, well, you know, what is the, the quality of water in these places? So next slide. So this is just showing um, that map. So this is actually more um, regulated water sources so places where you could pay to get water or at a chapter house, which is the community house, you know, they have an, a regulated source. So this is, you would go to the website, you would um, be able to hover over one of these uh, points, and then you would get information like shown here, where we have the, um, the, the loop, you know, what the name of the chapter is, you know, what the type of water source it is when it's open, you know, that type of thing for people to be able to better get information. So next slide. So um, I guess before I start this, so now Daniel Bean, who's actually moved from a master's program to a, a dissertation or a doctoral program, that is what his focus of his project is to do a similar website, but with the unregulated water sources. So he's right now got it together. It's being beta tested so that people can understand what they're looking at to, again, provide more information to folks about the unregulated sources. So I just wanted to end the, the talk a little bit about the importance of providing information back to the communities. And so in my group, we've tried a few different approaches. So we've learned a lot about what is effective and what is probably not worth your time. So um, actually another former student in my, my group, um, Tommy Rock, who's now um, faculty at NAU, um, wrote this paper really comparing different approaches. So what we found was that um, in terms of just trying to do sort of your typical, I'm gonna make radio announcements and flyers for a meeting that you know people were supposed to come to. And it didn't work so well because people are busy and they didn't necessarily want to come travel all the way to um, a chapter house or something for a meeting specifically about um, the, 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 the work that we had done. So better we found was working with um, grassroots organizations or community organizations to organize these report back meetings and really piggybacking on perhaps another event that's happening at the community house so that people are coming for more than one reason. And then also I talked a little bit about Lindsay's um, uh, distribution of the booklets and really is shown here in the picture, she's giving one of these report backs. So next slide. So with that, I just want to thank you for your attention. Um, uh, definitely have lots of acknowledgments. Uh, Mike Ketterer, who is, um, of, he was at NAU, he left, he came back, but he's very, very good with radionuclide um, chemistry. Um, and then of course our collaborators within the Navajo Nation, also Dr. Lewis's group at UNM, 
the Navajo Water Access Coordination Group. So that is the group that put together the website and then the um, unregulated website will probably be housed in that same um, area. And then of course, all my uh, students over time, definitely funding from the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, as well as US EPA. Um, and then funding mostly for students through the National Cancer Institute and the National Institute of General Medical Sciences. So with that, um, last slide, I will open it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Ingram, for your insights and your, and the study that you've, you've reported on. Um, very, very interesting, very concerning. Um, now is time for, if you've got a moment, um, questions from the board and academy staff. Sure. So um, not seeing any immediate questions, I'll, I'll raise one to okay. myself. And, and I think we're actually now have a backlog. Um, so given all that you've presented, what, what do you think is the most immediate need in response? If you had the ability to appeal to someone in Washington, what would you ask for? Right. I mean, probably very difficult to do, but is, um, some infrastructure to get plumbing <laughs> to homes and from sources, um, it's it's a really large area, so that's difficult. One thing that happened um, for a while, and the funding did dry out, was um, large uh, water water trucks taken to some of the sites that you know multiple families would water, haul their water from, so that they could get regulated water that was, you know, they knew it was it was um, good quality water. Um, oftentimes folks will haul from regulated sources that are further away for say drinking water and that kind of stuff. And then maybe use the unregulated sources for household work. And so it would just be helpful to have, um, you know, to know you have a source of water that is dependable and high quality. Um, because of fluctuations with drought and so forth, sometimes even the the watering points that are regulated go dry. So I think that would be really, really helpful um, for folks. Thank you. Um, I'll go in order that I saw the cards go up. Uh, Mike, I think you're next. Uh, thanks, Will. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Janicki. I guess I'm a Billagana from Albuquerque and part-time Lobo and <laughs> Uh, Tony Hillerman's kids went to my high school. Um, oh. So um, looking at the map, um, something that you didn't bring up was maybe transportation. And you just brought it up like moving water around. And I don't think people really realize uh, also the amount of unpaved roads. Oh. So is that also a challenge in bringing in water? I mean, yes. just going to events in Crown Point, And if it snowed or rain, you know, half of the people from across the Navajo Nation couldn't show up. Right. That, that's an extremely good point. Most of these unregulated wells are, again, intended for livestock. So they are in very remote places with no pavement. <laughs> and depending on um, the area, sometimes you think this isn't even a road. How do people get here, you know, to haul water? And then all of a sudden there'll be a vehicle that pulls up. And so it is, it's really challenging as far as particularly like you made the comment in the winter or in the spring with the rains because it's very clay. And so it can be very treacherous, really. I mean, my group, we take out four wheel drives, but a lot of folks don't have that that are out there. So it's there's a lot of difficulties with this. Another thing that I didn't bring up was just, you know, how we with plumbed water, use water, and during the pandemic, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Well, if you don't have very much water, that becomes difficult. So it's it's also a different utilization of water. Folks are very careful with their water compared to, you know, if you have indoor plumbing. Yeah, thank you. Charles? Yeah, Dr. Ingram, Charles Ferguson, uh, director of the board. Uh, on a on a personal note, I was thrilled to read on an interview you did that you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, 
and I admit, especially you, Jack Lambert. So I know uh, I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh area, so longtime Steelers fan too. Uh, so my I have a couple questions. One, I guess more technical. I was thinking about even the livestock wells. You know, people it's say like people weren't even if they were not using livestock wells for their own water, but you're still using it for livestock. Well, that that still will get into the food chain. So still concerned. Yeah. I think yeah. you you alluded to that, but I just want to just make that explicit point. Yeah. So to follow up on that, so we started the water work in 2003 and the report backs, folks would constantly ask, is there uranium in our mutton? So in our sheep, which is a traditional food of the Navajo. And I kept, I don't know, you know, I didn't know how to answer that. But one day, um, so I had a student who had a poster up, you know, outside my office and they had taken pictures of these sheep grazing on this abandoned mine to put on the poster. And the, the um, janitor on my floor came by my office and said, I think those are my sheep. And I was like, really? And that was the start of that trying to be able to answer the question that you're asking, um, because we work directly with the families, with the sheep. And, you know, we would go out and butcher as you would, you know, traditional Navajo butchering, but we would collect different organs and tissues. So I have a student who's finishing up her doc doctoral work, um, a Navajo student who we've been looking at that for a while and on from sheep from different parts of the Navajo nation. And we do see a bit elevation in, in different parts of the sheep compared to um, some, some sheep that we got off res about a hundred miles um, south of Navajo that were, you know, mainly fed uh, hay and that kind of stuff. So we should be putting that information out soon, but you're exactly right. And that was, that's been a concern of Navajo folks that, and, you know, plants. Um, and so we've done some plant work as well. Great. Thank you for that. And I, I know we're almost out of time, but the other kind of bigger issue that you've, you brought up and it's vitally important is how to effectively engage and have a conversation with, and then uh, have the exchange of inf respectful exchange of information with indigenous people, with people on Navajo. And I was just coming from uh, the Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference in Atlanta uh, just earlier this week and uh, attended a session they had there on environmental justice and uh, working with indigenous peoples and doing it in a respectful way. I think there's just so much, you know, the um, non-Indigenous world needs to understand about that. So uh, maybe you know, I'll follow up with you in a separate conversation about how can we do a better job as the national academies to create that type of forum, to be supportive, do it in a respectful way. And, uh, and I'll just briefly mention, you know, Mike Janicki and I were fortunate to uh, be directors for a couple of studies we did for uh, DOE's Office of Environmental Management on Hanford, you know, the cleanup of the Hanford site, and which impacts a number of tribal nations. And so, you know, trying to make that effort to get that input from those people to the relevant federal agencies and do it in a way where it truly is a two-way communication. Right. I, it's it's key. It's so important, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time to build that trust. But, you know, once, and, and you know, I'm a member of the Navajo Nation, but you, I, I know multiple researchers who are not, you know, indigenous folks who have, have gotten that trust. So it is, it isn't like you, okay, well, I'm not indigenous. I can't do this. That's not true. But there is a lot of um, time and, and understanding and listening and those kinds of things. So I, I really appreciate that because I think it's super important because there are a lot of issues across the nation that need to be addressed. Thank you, Dr. Ingram, for your time and for your insight. We we deeply appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Have a good rest of your meeting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll now hear from Dr. Njema Fraser, the Director of the Strategic Partnerships and Engagement in the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning in the Office of the DOE Undersecretary for Nuclear Security and Administrator of the National Nuclear Security Administration. Oh, and Jama, please use the microphone. 
but we'll get you started. Yeah, perfect. that'd be perfect. We have people online, so. <laughs> Red is good? Yes. Okay, it's counterintuitive. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to the folks in the room online. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you. I feel like this presentation is gonna be a little bit different um, in terms of levels of uh, technical specificity, but uh, some good information, I hope, um, and a good opportunity for me. So in its current instantiation, um, this is kind of the, we're under two years old. So um, we reside in NNSA, we were formerly in defense programs, and that was elevated by the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security up into her front office. So we are building, developing, shifting um, to kind of align to uh, that uh, office and the priorities and the strategic enterprise-wide view um, that we have to take upstairs. So let's give this a go. Okay. All right, so this is a great opportunity for me. Um, I will say that we've been very fortunate in that um, the administrator, Administrator Ruby, who is in charge of NNSA, has really focused on partnerships um, from Jump Street. So she was confirmed in July of 2021, and one of her first addresses to NNSA um, reference, oh, thank you so much, uh, reference partnerships. In her two top priorities, she had mission delivery and partnerships. And um, at the time from defense programs in NNSA, we still heard the call to action for that um, and really tried to make sure that we capitalized on her language, where she talked about having effective and efficient narratives that can be, you know, relayed to internal and external partners um, to really be able to communicate the value of partnerships highlight where partnerships occur throughout the NNSA um, and use that to kind of build um, the, the brand of using NNSA capabilities for national interest. And so um, she's very clear in that and was able to really drive that home. All right, so I'm gonna be managing a bunch of different things. All right, here we go. So I wanted to use this slide to do two things. The first is, instead of throwing up a massive DOE org chart at you, to just kind of show the um, line of succession, as it, as it were, when it comes to partnerships, right? So we have Secretary Granholm. She has five undersecretaries. One of them is the Undersecretary for Nuclear Security and Administrator NNSA. Underneath her sits the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning. And so that's headed by Cindy Lurston. And with the reorganization that occurred in 2023, underneath that sits myself. So that's strategic partnerships and engagement. So that's a simple way to do it. So that's that's um, the first goal of this slide. The second goal is to really say um, that the strategic vision that came out in 2022 is where we're getting our marching orders, right? It has a lot of key themes and covers the major mission areas but it also has some language and a lot of, of really strong toeholds into partnerships, collaboration, coordination, leveraging, all of those words that you would associate with partnerships. And so that came out in 2022, but we still use it very heavily um, to this day. And I think we will uh, through the end of uh, this current administration. And hopefully we've um, established enough um, documentation, processes, practices, that that will extend even beyond that. So um, within the strategic vision, you can kind of see here the mission priorities. Um, and for those who are uh, very familiar with NNSA, none of this will come as a surprise. You have stockpile stewardship, so your nuclear weapons, nuclear nonproliferation, um, uh, counterterrorism and counterproliferation, and you have naval reactors, right? So those are the first three. What was added, that was a great addition. Um, and I will say this document was produced by the Office of Policy and Strategic Planning. Um, so there's a lot of alignment there as well. Um, what was added was emerging 
challenges, right? So really, how do we deal with the fact that quite different from when NNSA, NNSA was established in 2000, we have a very rapidly shifting and nuanced um, uh, threat environment, right? And, you know, new two near peer adversaries, just a lot of things that, you know, weren't in play when we were first established, right? So how do we deal with those emerging challenges? How can partnerships help to do that? Um, and, and where, you know, within each of these major portfolios um, do partnerships, you know, uh, need to come into play and be stronger? So I'm gonna make sure I am hitting all my key points. I think I am. Need to get to the evolution where we have um, four hands. Mm -hmm. So uh, so at the top level, and this won't come to uh, as a surprise to any of you, um, if you've seen any of the administrator's testimony, uh, there was a nuclear deterrence summit, there was SW21. And so she actually, in. 2024 even, has been in a lot of public places talking about um, her national priorities, right, the challenges um, and where she's spending a lot of her energy as we try to kind of uh, round out this, this four years. Um, and so those areas you see here are nuclear deterrence needs in the long term. So we're talking beyond the mid 2030s, definitely beyond FinCEP, but beyond the mid 2030s as well. Um, how do we innovate to stay a ahead of our adversaries? Um, how do we build a robust, responsive, agile um, deterrent, right? So, you know, not only do we want to be able to protect ourselves and our allies, we want people to believe, right, that, you know, what we, what we say um, is actually, you know, um, viable in its options so that it could be a maximum deterrent um, for, for what we need in its various, you know, whatever um, uh, venue, venue we're talking about. And then we also want to position NNSA, um, and I mentioned this a little bit, to be agile in the face of emerging threats. And so at the highest level, there, are, there those are some key themes that you'll see coming out of the uh, administrators, both remarks internally and externally. So we all kind of know where we're going. All of her direct reports know and their direct reports and so on and so forth. And they told two friends. If you go further than that, I think I'm going to be able to do this. OK, so I'm going to, will this work if I just use the laptop? Ah. Oh. Going on. All right, not a problem. Um, so in the level below that is when you're talking about uh, the modernization efforts that are going on, right? And so we have um, used kind of our relationships and partnerships with DOD, uh, with the laboratories and with other agencies to really deliver, right? So mission delivery was that first key priority of the second being partnerships, um, over 200 modernized weapons. And that's in the last year to DOD. And that is uh, the most since the Cold War. So, you know, we have, we have this um, uh, national posture, right? We are just refurbishing, we're modernizing, we're not having new weapons. And so as these age, um, we need to make sure that we are still equipping the nuclear deterrent, right? Um, so it's it's a massive effort. Um, we are reconstituting some capabilities that had uh, go, gone dormant, and uh, we'll touch on that a little bit later. And then so, and we also have uh, a wide array of weapon systems that have their own unique needs. And so we're using our s and infrastructure um, expertise and, and the base that we have there in order to accomplish that. All right, another area, and I touched on s and briefly, um, is that we are using, um, we're, Focusing on pit production, um, reconstituting that capability. Uh, you may have 
uh, heard of our two site solution for uh, 80 pits per year. That comes up quite a lot in um, in testimony, um, and so we're on the path to doing that. And we're, you know, uh, with each passing month, we're more confident um, in being able to reconstitute that in a way that we have continuity of operations and that we're building it in a sustained fashion. So that is a uh, another real focus for the administrator. Um, and then we have an enterprise blueprint. Uh, which is, I will say, as a physicist, one of my favorite things in that we are looking at the sites, the facilities, the infrastructure, and what the needs are long term and how we can build out a plan for that. So that is something that's under development. There are, uh, well, dozens, dozens sounds about right, of different stakeholder entities that are being brought into those conversations, both inside and outside of NNSA, because we do ser serve so much of the s and needs for the nation. Um, and we'll get into our partnerships a little bit later. You know, we're bringing a lot of people to the table to say, what do you need? Um, we're also making sure that the equities when it comes to naval reactors, DNN, um, counterproliferation, things like that are taken into account um, and that we're not being just weapon systems based. Right. So we're developing that. We're hoping that goes out to 2050. Uh, that is the plan. And so that is uh, something that's really occupying a lot of our time within the administration. Um, the third thing is IT and cybersecurity. So we actually just had a lab plant site summit last week. And one of the things that came out of that is really modernizing what we have in the way of information technology and cybersecurity connectivity out at the sites to make sure that we can be agile and responsive um, and that we are taking advantage of the latest technology. Um, you know, you know, some of these buildings and, and the infrastructure contained therein, the pipes, the everything um, is really like pre-Cold War, you know, so it's, 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 uh, it's old. And so we are making a concerted effort. The administrator is very, um, keen to make sure um, that we are utilizing, you know, um, all the resources at our disposal and that we're moving out in a way um, that allows us to be prepared for future challenges. And then I have here kind of a catch all with AI, machine learning, uh, digital transformation, uh, right? This list could go on. Um, something I don't have on here, biosecurity, Right. So there are a lot of other areas, you know, and uh, that we're make, trying to make sure that we cover um, that really are reflective of the environment being um, more mercurial than it used to be uh, in the past. All right. And then I did want to touch on before I get to uh, my programmatics is international collaboration and coordination, right? Which is clearly, which is vital. Um, we talked about it, uh, you know, at the outset with the kind of global environment, global threat environment. Um, but when you get into things like um, nuclear detonation detection, when you get into nuclear forensics, you know, you really are talking about the NNSA capabilities being used on a um, global platform to kind of make sure that we're ensuring ourselves and our allies um, are safe. So those are those are key main areas at the highest level, then a little bit below that when you get to modernization s and and international collaboration. So I'm gonna stop for a second and see if there are any questions about that because part two goes into my actual program. But you know, hopefully that gives you a flavor of how pervasive it is uh, within NNSA and how it can you know, be broadly applicable right, to um, agencies writ large within the US. Okay. All right, so I mentioned a little bit of the uh, step down. So I wanted to put in a little bit of the uh, work that goes on in NA 1.1, including this last paragraph that we are um, adding to the bullets um, about partnerships um, and collaboration. So um, 
the policy and strategic planning office does a lot of good work. I mentioned the lab plant and site summit. There are administrator strategy forums where they bring in people throughout the complex to kind of talk about how we partner um, with other agencies. Um, we do a lot with the lab plants and sites when it comes to strategic planning and making sure that that's coordinated. And then this last one that you have here is really making sure that we are partnering at in the interagency way, we're party, partnering with industry, which is a growth area for us, and that we're partnering with academia, also a growth area for us. So a lot of that work in uh, academic programs is going on in defense programs now, but we want to make sure that we are talking to you know, consortia uh, for uh, HBCUs and TCUs that we're talking about things that have to do with what we need for the pipeline and the workforce, right? So there are things that kind of span enterprise-wide what we need when it comes to industry and academia. And so that's what we'd be focused on. So, you know, it would hit us in a few different ways in NNSA, but it would uh, touch on us in NA 1.1. All right. All right. So strategic partnerships and engagements. So really simply, you know, if we're doing this right, we are having a robust and enduring um, network of partnerships right throughout those sectors that help us to benefit the nation using NNSA's capabilities. So I'm sure that's not word for word, I'm not trying to, but, but that really is what drives us as a staff to make sure that we are facilitating those partnerships. We are launching those uh, relationships, those conversations, um, and really understanding in what novel ways, um, as well as traditional ways that we can partner and, and use our, use NIF, um, use the exascale computing that we're, you know, anticipating from El Capitan. So how are we using those things? Using expertise to be like, all right, if there are um, nest activities, if there are other things where, you know, they need people to help, um, you know, NNSA was, you know, really called upon um, during COVID. Uh, we're called upon during national disaster. So really using our tools, um, the expertise to, to really um, have broader impact. Um, we're doing a lot of things. We just did a um, strategic outlook initiative on climate change, right? So really it's you can do the, use the tools for a wide variety of things um, going forward. So won't read that slide, but I think I've talked long enough that everybody can see what's on the slide. All right. So what are the three major thrusts um, that we have currently um, in my office? One is strategic partnership projects. Um, this is also known as work for others previously, uh, sometimes known as assisted acquisitions, <laughs> right? So um, this is really where we have the laboratories partnering with other agencies for the most part, uh, the majority of which is DOD, but also DHS, NASA, uh, NIH, you know, you name it. So, you know, having those partnerships, having those other agencies understand um, that there is a, uh, a vehicle by which they can partner with the laboratories. Um, we have field offices that help to manage that um, in terms of those partnerships. Um, and those have really yielded um, a, born a lot of fruit from the work that's been done there. So slightly different from LDRD and, and other, you know, types of relationships, um, but really that, that synergy is what um, really helps bring it together for NNSA. Second thrust is our FACA committee, uh, which is ACNS. It is the, at currently at, at this time, it's the only uh, federal advisory committee uh, within NNSA. Uh, that too was in defense programs and was brought up and is now, um, you know, uh, at the behest of the administrator. It has kind of broadened our remit before it was just the weapons account. Now we have uh, nuclear nonproliferation and, and the things that I mentioned before. So it really is agency-wide um, that those studies are happening. And then we have tech transfer policy. So this is the one, it's it's a little, I tried to use 
my PowerPoint skills. Um, it's colored in a little bit because we've um, gone away from the programmatic aspects of it, which are going to reside in other elements of NNSA, and really started thinking about the policy aspects of it, right? How do we engage with other, how do we just engage with the Department of Commerce or how do we engage with the Department of Transportation when it comes to technology transfer, MOUs, CRADAs, um, getting things to commercialization, all of those type of things. What needs to be in place to kind of enable that and benefit from it? So that's where the tech transfer policy piece comes in. And so those are ma the three major thrusts um, for the organization at the moment. All right, so I'll go into these one by one. I think we'll have plenty of time still for to address any questions or feel free to address them at whenever you feel comfortable. I'm looking back there for the um, folks online. So in short, the mission is to make sure that we have strong relationships with our strategic partners, right? For world-class S&T. This really is an S&T leaning effort um, but we are just enabling it. The s and is occurring out at the laboratories, right, um, with those subject matter experts. But we are making sure that that is enabled. Um, this has benefits um, not only for the science and technology that it yields, but also um, in the satisfaction of our workforce, um, recruiting, retention, development, um, it uh, is money into the uh, admit into NNSA. I don't, I don't want to get administration mixed up with administration. It is money into NNSA. The size of uh, SPP is about three billion per year that goes to the various sites. Um, the lead in that is Sandia, um, but also it's also at the plants. It's Kansas City, Y12, and then of course the other tri labs, so Livermore, Los Alamos, et cetera. So that really is a source of funding. If you guys, uh, you know, I know you're intimately aware of uh, continuing resolutions and things like that. So you know that it there are times where it really helps, and there are also ebbs and flows and things like life extension programs and modernization programs, right? So it really comes into play and helps to soften some of the, what could be sharper edges when it comes to um, kind of workforce continuity of operations, continuity of work. So there's a science bent to it. Um, there's a personnel bent to it. And then there's also the partners that we have where we have kind of boutique needs, right? And only a few people do it. Right. So how do we maintain, you know, and keep those, you know, entities alive and flourishing? And so SPP helps a bit with that as well. So um, and there are a couple of people in the room that can help me if I've, if I've missed anything key in those areas. But those are some of the goals. You can see those in front of you as well as the vision and the mission. All right. So I mentioned um, the sponsoring organizations for this uh, $3 billion plus dollars. You can kind of see there that the majority, can you see, Can you read the names? I can't tell how small it is. It looks small to me, but I have these, so, all right. Okay. So you have DOD, right, state, DHS, and so forth. So, so we really, you know, and then we have some um, that we've uh, glommed together because we're, you know, uh, some of our activities by their nature, um, don't want to to necessarily be uh, called out, but they are, you know, really ensuring that we meet our mission um, of nuclear deterrence, safety for our nation, security for our nation. So this just gives you kind of a picture of, um, you know, the the market share, as it were, uh, in these areas. And I mentioned synergy, so I wanted to make sure that we did underscore the fact that these are really mutually beneficial um, engagements, right? It's not like they're taking an NSA off course, right, to work on something that's not mutually beneficial um, to us. So that's that's just a really key. I know sometimes, you know, if we talk to staffers or other people, they're like, isn't that you know, time away from what you could be doing. But I will say that, you know, while we 
devote these uh, resources, right, to the federal government writ large and service to the nation, what we get back in terms of new technology and innovative ideas for the solutions that we need really make it worthwhile. So um, sometimes their solution is our solution, right, a lot of times, so. All right. And then I just did have one example um, that stood out to me uh, for, for obvious reason, um, is that we are having, we do have a training center that's funded jointly um, with uh, DHS. In fact, I think they may be funding it. There are a few folks that are funding it. I stopped going through my notes and just doing it top of the dome. Um, there are a few agencies that fund this and I wanna give it right for attribution. Um, so Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, NPD funding is used for developing and delivering the courses, transportation, food, and housing for students for these in-residence courses. Um, the Y-12 Nuclear and Radiological Field Training Center um, is providing the training in safe, secure, and realistic environment using expert instruction and personnel to serve as observers and evaluation for customer training. So they do a lot of scenario-driven training, um, courses that are really um, uh, unique to the needs of the agency. And so really being able to you know, coalesce and leverage um, what we have within NNSA for the broader uh, federal community um, has yield, borne a lot of fruit when it comes to these areas. So, you know, our lab plants and sites do have quite a bit of activity that's going on um, for other agencies um, as well as ourselves. All right. So this is what I'll, I'll leave this with. It says purpose, so it seems like it should be on the front end, but it's to wrap up for SPP is that SPP really is providing that key, right? It really is unlocking doors for uh, one of a kind capabilities that we have in NNSA. Um, you know, even if there are things in, you know, DOE writ large or other agencies, having the associated personnel and infrastructure to accommodate that is something that uh, NNSA takes a lot of pride in um, and we're happy that it can be used for these purposes. So that wraps up the SPP portion and we'll move on to ACNS. Think I'm okay, I'm done it too? Got it. All right, so the Advisory Committee for Nuclear Security. Um, so this was formerly um, Defense Programs Advisory Committee it got moved up and you can see some of the themes there um, for the new committee in terms of nuclear deterrence, non-proliferation, counter-terrorism, counter counter-proliferation classes. Um, and so we've been active um, since May, 2023. And we've had four meetings since then. Um, our first report uh, was was on DNN futures, defense nuclear non-proliferation futures, kind of that path forward. We just turned in, and by just, I mean June 4th and June 5th, uh, the two subcommittee reports on integrated plutonium program on the 4th and on the 5th pipeline and workforce. So the administrator was very clear. She wanted these done in six months or less. She would give us the resources to make that happen for committee and subcommittee members. Um, she wanted them to be um, streamlined. She wanted them to be actionable in terms of the reports. And she wanted them to be hard hitting and really forward leaning. And so the committee members, can you see them on the bottom? You can, okay, I can't see it on the screen. Um, the committee members have really leaned into that. Dr. Don Cook, who was former um, NA-10, former head of defense programs in NNSA, um, also lab director at AWE and host of other things. And, and I'm sure uh, you guys may have run across him in various boards. Uh, he is the chair of ACNS. Um, and so he is really, you know, uh, working in concert with 
with us um, as federal staff to make sure that we are delivering on what the administrator is asking. The last, the next two reports, I won't say last two, the next two reports on modern materials and manufacturing, as well as ST&E revitalization, and that's revitalization of the infrastructure base, um, are due at the end of September. So those will be five in total with DNN starting, these four you see on this wheel. And then what the administrator asked us to do is start thinking about the next two reports, right? So we are going at a really rapid turn and we are so lucky that we have uh, members that are willing to kind of, you know, lean into uh, this aggressive timeline, but she's very conscious of the fact she wants the advisory committee um, to be sustained through administrations, right? And so having something kind of in the, in the pipeline, as it were, um, is something that, that we're really leaning into. So uh, there are various topics that have come up in our meetings um, and that are on the table. So we're thinking about five and, well, no, yeah, six in studies, six and seven at the moment. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of see the areas there on the, on the far, left um, and we'll see what we come up with, but it's something, you know, if I talk about something that's topical for the June to September timeframe is for us to really narrow down, you know, what we're gonna select next um, to have that going forward. And this kind of says it, this is actually out of date just because uh, pipeline and workforce should be a uh, stop. So, you know, we really are committing to the six months um, doing tough areas. The integrated plutonium program study had so many, it had PU aging, it had pit production, it had aging infrastructure. I mean, you can only imagine, right? So um, that, was, that was a juggernaut. So we just got that one done. Modern materials and manufacturing, right? That's a complex one too, right? So how do you do this in a way where you're going to take into account um, how easy or difficult it would be to get the same materials later, right? Um, how do you use digital engineering, right? What are some of these in situ processes that you can start thinking about? Um, how does how do you qualify and certify these? You know, how do you qualify these things to a degree where everybody has confidence in them? So, modern materials and manufacturing, I can go through each of these. Um, uh, ad nauseum, but I won't. But you know, you kind of get the idea. We're trying to um, hit, and the administrator has kind of encouraged us to hit really, you know, complex and nuanced areas. Um, and and she can then use that to help, uh, you know, drive program. All right. So yes, and you can kind of see the TBDs on on the ones upcoming. So this kind of states what I had earlier. And the last area I wanted to hit is tech transfer policy, right? So there are various tiers that are both internal to NNSA, um, between NNSA and DOE writ large. There's also an Office of Technology Transitions. Um, there's a General Counsel's Office. There's the Office of Science. There are a lot of people who have equities when it comes to tech transfer. And then you can imagine the inner agency, right? And, and what we wanna to do to be kind of aligned to what we're doing nationally. So there are various tiers of tech transfer policy. And just to give you a, an idea of scale, um, between the tri-labs, um, the tri-labs account for the, the largest bundle, accumulated bundle of patents in the federal government. Right, so that's not all DOE labs, that's Livermore, Los Alamos and Sandia, right? So we wanna make sure that we are um, investing in and being forward thinking when it comes to what we need um, to you know, do oversight of lab licensing, right? But not be so cumbersome that we are um, uh, stunting a process right? That is working really well. We want to foster innovation, um, being proactive and people really being excited about um, tech transfer and commercialization within the industry. So, so that's tech transfer policy. And so what's next? And then we'll have like 10 minutes for questions. So you saw that you see the first three, 
right? So SPP, ACNS, TTP, um, but we also want to grow in the areas of public-private partnerships, engaging with industry. I mean, uniquely, we're situated here in DC, right? Um, so there's no issue with finding industries with which we can start thinking more strategically about how we build our relationships where we have areas of mutual interest, how we can leverage and partner. So, so that's a direction we want to go in um, that we I, that I think is is pretty untapped to date. And then, when it comes to these studies, right? So we have National Academy studies, we have the ACNS and Faculty Committee studies, we have Jason studies, right? And all these recommendations, findings, and recommendations come forward, right? But how are we holding ourselves accountable? right, for tracking those, even if we say, already did it, OBE, right, but where is that going, and how do we do that, um, and how much credibility will that then, you know, lend us, right, when we ask people to put in all these man hours to generate these studies and reports, right, so, so that's an area where I think that, you know, we have a great um, proximity to ACNS, as a test bed to, you know, see how we would do that and how we would build that out. So still we're about a year and a half in, maybe less. Um, some things were approved. Of, I keep looking at my wonderful former staff folks. Um, so we're about a year and a half in. Um, and so, you know, that, that pretty much uh, encapsulates uh, where we are and where we want to go next. So. I will open it up. We have about eight minutes for questions. Uh, and thank you guys really for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, I don't know if your tent is up from a previous, but Charles, it looks like you're on the move. Dr. No, Frazier and Jamin, you. thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I learned a lot from that. It was a great overview. So. Maybe I'm a product of what I was recently exposed to at a conference earlier this week, uh, mentioned that I was at in Atlanta, um, American Chemical Society had their 28th annual Green Chemistry and Engineering Conference. So it's a relatively new field established about 30 years ago. Uh, Paul Anastas at that time was at EPA and then John Warner as well. And they established the 12 principles of green chemistry and engineering. And what I noticed at that conference is the excitement among early career scientists and engineers. So I'm thinking that, um, you know, how much are is you all in your program, your, your team, thinking about ways of attracting that kind of younger talent, that next generation talent, and doing it in a way that supports national security missions, yeah. but also doing a way that's environmentally sustainable, using, you know, like the practices of green chemistry and chemical engineering. And, and then also kind of related to that, because the conference at ACS was AI enabled green chemistry. So I'm thinking how much are you all <clears throat> using AI and machine learning tools and techniques yeah. to uh, be, be more efficient, more effective in your, in your programs, in your technical areas? Yeah. So I will say that we have we just touched that the pipeline and workforce um, report that is not yet it's to the administrator um, and we're rolling out our comms plan on it. Um, but I think you're right on target, right? With how do you use um, emerging technologies, right, and the tools that we have to really appeal to this younger generation of talent, right, that we want to get in the complex, right? Where are we uh, shooting ourselves in the foot with things like, you can't have your cell phone all day, you know, because you're in this classified area or, you know, like where, where, I mean, there are limitations, but like where, you know, being at least cognizant of it, right? There's also, there's the telework, right? And this climate after COVID, right? So yeah, I think you're exactly right that it's something that, you know, needs focused attention. Um, and we have, the labs are doing it. I think they're definitely ahead of headquarters when it comes to that. But this last study was an integrated look at it. So uh, Sam Graham and Sarah Posey were the care, chair and co-chair of that subcommittee. 
Um, and they went out to, uh, I can't even, doesn't, you know, different focus groups, right, of different populations to kind of get those types of, you know, um, cases, right, and and get those vantage points uh, to roll into the report. So I'm really hoping it, that we can not only have the report to stand for that, but also get to this implementation of study results, right, to build that into how we move forward. Does that answer your question? It's it does. Question. And then maybe quickly on the AI question, are you all uh, thinking about using AI and machine learning? The, yeah. So we're, we're, we're thinking about AI. We are partnering with some folks that are ahead of us in thinking about it um, to figure out how we can uh, utilize it. There is because of the, you know, we have open right, science, and then we have the nuclear security stuff. So how, you know, so we're thinking about how to do it, um, how to make AI smarter where we want it to be smarter and not smarter where we don't want it to be smart. So there are things like that, right? So using it, but if we're asking these people to go into jobs that are, yeah. So, so yeah, so it, it becomes complex, but it's definitely uh, happening in terms of a discussion. Yeah. Paul? Hey, just a quick question about the uh, advisory committee reports. Mm -hmm. anyway, I wasn't sure. Are they declassified or? So we've been trying to keep them unclassified okay. or at least CUI so, because of the, you know, right. range of distribution. Yep. Well, I'm interested in John Harvey stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I used to work for John in the office of policy. So, but the question is, how do you implement these things? What's the process? Once this report's produced? What is your organization? What's in it? How are you going to yeah. take work that they've done and convert it, number one, into budget? Mm -hmm. How are you going to do that? Yep. So um, I'll, I'll take it in, in parts, right? Um, for DNN, which was the only one before this week that had come in, um, NA20, the DNN office, wrote down what they were going to do for each recommendation. Right. And they wrote down the enablers and the constraints for that. One thing that does help with accountability is being on the agenda for the next advisory board meeting. Right. So we're instituting that kind of systematic, you know, accountability. If you yielded a report, then you should be talking about it. So the one we have, we have our next meeting, August 13th. So there are going to be interim reports. And they're going to be closeout reports, but they're also going to be reports from Corey Henderson, who is the head of NA20, and Marv Adams, who is the head of NA of Defense Program. Sorry for the organization numbers, but you know we're having them come and brief the committee on what they're doing when it comes to budgets. Um, I I don't know how we deal with that. Um, other than trying to use it um, when we are talking to OMB and when we are talking to Congress about what our needs are. Um, the reason that the administrator wants us tackling these things is because they are external reviews, right? So they, you know, hopefully they carry the weight of that versus us saying, you know, give us all the things, right? So um, the FY25 budget is about 25 billion that's right um so yeah so it gets tough to be like oh and we also need right but you know in terms of prioritization um documenting and really having the programs accountable for s addressing each of the recommendations that's what we're trying to do going forward so we'll do that again for ipp and we'll do it for pipeline and workforce for the various programs yep uh, thank you. That was a good answer. <laughs> Ellie, you get the last question. Any online? No. Hi, uh, I'm Ellie Melamed. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was thank so you. compelling and interesting. And I used to work in DNN. And so from the perspective of you know, trying to get things done, I was just curious, how big is your own office and how many people do you have uh, to do all this work, then, yeah. um, you know, a little bit, just a few words about the structure. Sure, sure. Clearly are playing a pretty important role in this broad partnership area. Yeah. So our office is very small. 
So I have three feds and a contractor. Uh -huh. um, I have another contractor matrixed in from 1.1. Um, and then hopefully we'll get a graduate fellow this summer. So super small. So um, we, <laughs> we are working on, uh, within 1.1, we are working on how we um, pull in other staff to kind of help and support us with this. Yeah. Um, we also had another person matrixed in, I think she did governance. Um, so, you know, so, so we do that as needed. So we communicate with a larger 1.1 office, but in terms of my SPE team, small. Yeah. Me. Well, it's impressive. How three you fans in the country. Have yeah. your fingers in. Thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. All we, right. We appreciate really enjoyed your it. Thank you. Presentation. So now we move to uh, Mr. Paul Murray, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Spent Fuel and High-Level Waste Disposition mm -hmm. in the Office of Nuclear Energy at the Department of Energy. Sorry, everybody, I was just trying to get my computer to work there. Uh, do, do you mind if Welcome. I drive the slides floor. today? Is that... Excellent, do you mind if I drive the slides? Yeah, that's, that's fine. fine. Just share my screen. Okay, let me share my screen. Uh, it says host is disabled sharing. It should be working now, Paul. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Windows there. Okay, can everyone see it? Great, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so let me introduce myself. So I'm Paul Murray. I'm originally from the UK, uh, 44 years in the nuclear industry. I joined DOE Nuclear Energy last October. Uh, this is only my fourth position I've ever held in my career. The first seven years I spent with the UK Ministry of Defence, designing, building, commissioning nuclear attack submarines. My second job was with the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. We had operational advanced reactors. I actually operated the reprocessing line for sodium fast reactor fuel. I supported BNFL and the design, build, and commissioning and operation of large commercial reprocessing plants at Sellafield. And I also designed and commissioned all the waste treatment plants that go with fats, uh, reprocessing plants. In uh, 1996, I moved to the US, primarily to work with DOE EM. In 2007, I joined Ariva to look at advanced reactors and reprocessing in the US. Ariva became Irano. Uh, my last position was the Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Irano Federal Services. So, when I first joined DOE Nuclear Energy, I wanted to understand the history of waste treatment and, uh, not waste treatment, sorry, spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste. And there's a long history dating back to the 1950s where the Academy of Science actually made the recommendation that as nuclear technology was being deployed, we actually needed, as a country, a deep geological repository. So I'm going to call out some dates on this chart here. 1982, Congress passed the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Tremendous document. It actually sits on my bedside table. Extremely well written. It laid out a consent-based siting process for how to select a future repository. 1987, It was amended and Yucca Mountain was. The important thing as we sit here today is the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, as amended, is still the law of the land. Okay. Pro Yucca, anti Yucca, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is still the law of the land. Yeah. The other thing to bear in mind as well is 
where we are today, when we first started this program, looking at what to do with spent nuclear fuel, the industry was young. The world was our oyster. We had lots of like, options moving forward. Today, we're sort of set in, in certain paradigms that we cannot get out of. Uh, the operating light water reactor fleet has paid into the nuclear waste fund that currently stands at about $45 billion. Uh, in around about 2010, all funding for the Office of Civilian Mad Waste Management was stopped. And so the Yokomanzin project stopped, the Office of Civilian Mad Waste Management disappeared. The remaining people moved into DOE nuclear energy. So Akram was an engineering organization, DOE Nuclear Energy is an R&D organization. 2014, the utility sued for breach of contract to recover their costs for all the damages associated with managing of spent nuclear fuel. And so between 2010 and 2024, we've really been uh, an R&D program. So the second thing I want to know is what's my liability, okay? So if you look at this, this table, uh, second column from the right shows you the annual cost of what the utilities sue us each and every year. So an average is about $800 million a year that the utilities sue us for breach of contract. My current program is just less than $100 million a year. Yeah. Our, outs our outstanding liability, assuming everything falls right and we move forward on the path I'm going to talk about now, is $34 billion. I want to stress that this is a very conservative number. And it, it's the number that we put out there each, each year. So what am I responsible for in this program? Who are my stakeholders? I'm responsible for all the spent nuclear fuel from, from the operating light water reactors. I'm responsible for picking it up, transporting it to interim storage or to a deep geological repository. So in total, I have about 140,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel from the existing light water reactor fleet. I'm also responsible for DOE EM's high-level waste from the vitrified waste at uh, Savannah River, Hanford, Idaho, and West Valley. So in total, about 21,000 21, canisters of vitrified waste. I'm responsible also for disposing of the Navy spent nuclear fuel. They will transport it. I am responsible for disposing of it. I'm responsible for disposing of the DOE spent nuclear fuel. And should we build any advanced reactors, I'm also responsible for disposing of the spent nuclear fuel from advanced reactors. So where are we today? 1958, we started the program. In 2024, we actually have 94 operating reactors. But the important thing is we have 20 shutdown reactor sites. So reactors that have completely shut down, in some cases, the reactor has been completely decommissioned, gone away. The only thing left on the site is for spent nuclear fuel. Today, as we sit here talking, I actually have 92,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel sitting on Isfasis of Amber Country. As I mentioned, and I'll mention again, at the end of the current light water reactor fleet, I will have a total of 140,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel. The schedule I'm going to talk about today and the timeline we're talking about today, all the current operating light water reactors will shut down. So this is for illustrative purposes only based on the current license extensions that the fleet has put in place. But there's quite a precipitous fall off in the operating reactors. An important thing to realize is that only operating reactors will pay into the waste fund to pay for a future repository. If they're not operating, they don't pay in. Okay. But one day, all the system reactors shut down, all those sites become stranded sites. This is where the DOE spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste is, Savannah River, West Valley, Fort St. Drain, Idaho, Hanford. 
as I mentioned earlier, total of about 21,000 canisters. Okay. So that's what I'm responsible for. I understand my liability. Mm, then we want to talk a little bit about advanced reactors. <laughs> Everybody talks about the advanced reactor. We're pouring billions and billions of dollars into advanced reactors, but nobody talks about what comes out the back end of these reactors. Nobody talks about the spent fuel and high level waste. If you follow the process, NRC licenses for design to say it's safe. To get a construction permit, the reactor operator has to be in good faith negotiation with DOE. We are in good faith negotiation with anybody who wants to come to talk to us. To get an operating license, the advanced reactor operator has to sign an amended standard contract with DOE to say we will take the fuel. This is where the questions start to come in now. Some of these fuels have to be treated before we can accept them for disposal. Who pays the cost of treating that fuel? It's not DOE's responsibility to treat fuel. Our partner EM vitrifies its waste. The light water reactors put their fuel in a form that we can dispose of it directly. Advanced reactors, if the fuel needs to be treated, that has to be part of the O&M cost for, for the reactor. Okay. So believe it or not, this is actually a good, good news story. <laughs> so as we sit here today, as a country, we do not have a plan from where we are today through the closing a future geological repository. It's, it's quite shameful. So one and I've reorganized my group. Uh, I've appointed a senior manager to actually start to look at the schedule and costs for the entire back end of the fuel cycle. Let, let me give you some indication. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the schedule later. But the important thing to realize is sitting here today, we do not have a plan. Sitting here today is the largest user of nuclear energy in the world. We are the only Western country, with the exception of the, the Ukraine, that does not have an active repository program. Okay. So, good news. The Atlas Railcar, safest railcar in the world for moving spent nuclear fuel. Mm -hmm. Instrumented, we can anticipate, we can see in real time what's going wrong, or if anything's going wrong with this railcar. Atlas received its certification earlier this week. I was just out in Denver. I just flew back this morning. We parked our rail car next to the Navy rail car and we invited visitors to see it. We now have the ability to start moving spent nuclear fuel by rail. It's ready. Nothing's stopping us. Okay. The high burnet demonstration cask. So NRC licenses dry storage of spent nuclear fuel. All fuel coming out of the reactors today is high burn up. 20, so NRC originally licensed dry storage of high burn up fuel for 20 years. 20 years rapidly came up on us and we had no data to support the storage of high burn up fuel past 20 years. So the high burn up demonstration project was started. Right? So a cask was loaded with high burn-up fuel. It was instrumented, and it sits there at the North Anna site in Virginia, collecting data to say nothing. Things happening to spent nuclear fuel. Everybody's happy. Uh, pads. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next then I'll see toll gate. Oh, yeah. You you froze for a few moments. Um and oh. so we didn't hear probably what you said over the last 45 seconds. Okay. Sorry, I apologize about that. Not your so fault. High, yeah, yeah. So the high Bennett demo cast is basically collecting data to show that nothing is happening to high Bennett fuel in dry storage. Si over 60 reactors, current operating fleet point to this cask to show that nothing's happening, right? The next toll gate for NRC requires for this cask to be opened in 20, by 2038 and all the data 
collected. So we need to do PIE exams on, on the fuel. We need to examine the fuel. Everything has to be done by 2038. The only window we really have to move the cask is in 2027. So we are looking to move this cask on our shiny new Atlas rail car in 2027 to a new home, do all the R&D we need to do to keep the current operating fleet going. The U.S. utilities point to this and say this is the most important R&D program that DOE is doing to support the operating fleet. Okay. So how do we build public confidence, public trust? I would like to do a big package performance demonstration again. I'd like to take a package. I'd like to crash it into a wall, drop it, drop it in the lake, fish it out the lake, set it on fire, put the fire out, pick it up, put it on my rail car and drive it off into the sunset. We're seriously looking at, at this. We're getting a lot of support from industry to do this. We're getting a lot of support internationally to do this. Uh, we will release an RFI very soon to see what members of the public would like us to see. What are they worried about? And then we're going to try and start to move forward with it. Even the Navy is interested in responding to our, to our, our, our RFI. We have to... The only thing that's stopping the program right now, there's no technical issues stopping us. It's all public trust and political trust. Everything we do will be aimed at building public trust and political trust moving forward. The Federal Consolidated Interim Storage Facility. Okay. So this facility is, is going to be owned and operated by DOE. Why should, does it need to be owned and operated by DOE? The only way we can get out from under the liabilities, $800 million each year we get sued, is for DOE to take title to that fuel. So the facility has to be owned and operated by DOE. The design of this facility is proceeding on schedule. In May of this year, we passed what was called critical decision zero in the project management process. It was a major milestone for the project. Uh, we are moving ahead with critical decision one, so the detailed design of the facility. It's currently planned that this facility will be operational in 2038 to 2042. It's designed to accept all the fuel from the shutdown reactor sites. So we can move fuel from the stranded sites to this facility to basically lift the burden on those communities moving forward. So between 2027, when I moved the high burn at demo cask and 2038 is a long time. I want to go back and look at the Blue Ribbon Commission recommendation to say, look at moving between shutdown reactor sites. Why should I do this? It's going to cost money. There's got to be some incentive for the host site to take it. So for me, looking at it from the engineering perspective, when I open my interim, the big interim storage facility, I will accept fuel at 500 tons a year, 1,000 tons a year, slowly ramping up to 3,000 tons a year receipt rate. If... And the other problem I have is all the funding is hockey sticked. All I'm requesting funding from Congress in the last few years to build the facility and the infrastructure I need. If I can start moving fuel between shutdown reactor sites, I can build all the trains I need, or buffer cars, security cars, everything I need, I can move to the left. I can then start moving large quantities of fuel so I can build public trust, I build capability, I build experience. So when I do open my facility, instead of having a slow ramp up of the seat of spent nuclear fuel there, maybe I can go at 2,000 tons a year. And I can buy myself years back in the operation of this facility. And remember, every year I get sued $800 million. Okay, So if I can save two or three years in the operation of this facility, I potentially save the country billions of dollars. Consent-based siding. We hear a lot about consent-based siding. It's a lot of, lot, of, lot of talk about it. We have 12 consortia which we are funding going around the country, 
just talking to the general public about nuclear, spent nuclear fuel, high level waste. Last time I looked, we had 370 million people in the US. But my 12 consortia will touch optimistically a fraction of 1% of the total population of the US. What we are doing is, as, as we talk to the general public, we're using other parts of DOE, like the GAIN program, who are out talking to the governors, the elected officials, the senators, the congressmen about coal to nuclear, new nuclear, the expansion of nuclear. We're using GAIN to basically talk at the, at the elected official level to say, spent nuclear fuel, this is what DOE is up to on consent-based siding. As they move forward, give them a chance, basically. Okay. This is the schedule. That, sorry. We, so the consortia are doing a lot of good work. Don't get me wrong. They really are doing a lot of good work, but it's really hard to judge what they're doing. So we, up on our website, we trying to update monthly the number of meetings they've had, the number of engagements they've had. And we also have the, the timeline of where they are. So the consortia have been going since September of 2023. One month before I joined DOE, they were awarded their contracts, they started their contract negotiations, and they really started work around about the same time as I started work. The schedule on the left is where DOE is in the entire process. Okay, so consortia are out there. We are developing uh, site screening criteria. And then we will sometime relatively soon go out for a call for volunteers for communities to basically come forward to be considered. We're not asking them to commit to taking the facility, but we're asking them to come forward to engage in discussions with us to learn more about what we're doing. WIP. I used to actually sit on the board of WIP. So WIP, for all intents and purposes, is a deep geological repository. Half a mile below the surface, it's been operational for 25 years, operated by DOE EM disposes of transgenic waste from the cleanup of the weapon sites. WIP was recently granted a permanent extension for a further 15 years of operation. In that, in that extension, DWEM committed to the state of New Mexico to report yearly on their progress to find a second repository. Yeah. I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. But WIP is, an is, is a great example of what and how a repository works. So what am I doing on my repository program? So since 2010, we've been in a holding pattern. Other countries are moving forward with their repositories, US industry supporting them moving forward. Every year it goes by, we fall one year behind. We start to become more and more irrelevant to what the rest of the world is doing. Okay. As I mentioned right at the beginning, the Nuclear Waste Policy Act is still the law of land. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act is a very well written document. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act tells me that the first repository, Yucca Mountain, has a limit of 63,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel. Nuclear Waste Policy Act also says that I cannot increase the capacity of the first repository until the second repository is operational. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act also allows me to do non-site specific work on the second repository. I want to explore that. I want to see what that means. Let sleeping dogs lie, move past the argument of, of Yucca Mountain, let's start talking about the second repository. One of the things I've learned in my program is we do do a lot of international collaboration on R&D. We, we pay a relatively small amount of money into this and we leverage that money by a factor of 10 or 15. I'm gonna to continue to support this program because it helps 
to maintain capability. It helps to, to maintain young people in the program, and it helps to keep international ties. I am seriously evaluating how to send DOE engineers and managers to work on international programs. DOE HR is currently looking at how this is going to work for me. I was recently at the EDRAM conference in Tokyo with the other countries that have repository programs. I asked several of them, would they be willing to let DOE managers and engineers work in their programs to learn everything from the early stages of the program through to, to side in the facility. I even talked to Finland about how can my engineers learn how to, to be involved in the last stages of opening the repository. They want to support US industry, but build capability in US industry. So when we do start the program again, we're ready to go on day one and we're not trying to build that capability up. As I mentioned, DOE, EM and WIP have to look for a second repository. I'm hoping to start for looking for a second repository. Can we work together to start looking for the second repository? Yeah. Opportunities, slowed, controlled, steady progress, but builds public trust and, and as we move forward. Strong engagement with tribal rep representatives. I met with the tribes earlier this week. I'm about to fund a new consortia, which is purely tribal. So we'll make sure that we have tribal input into what we're doing. I need to engage with multiple stakeholders, but I need controlled and consistent engagement. Nobody trusts DOE. We, one minute we're there, the next moment, minute they don't see us for years. We need controlled engagement with our stakeholders. We need to seek input to decisions and designs wherever possible. If I go back to the interim storage facility design, it's a two and a half square mile parking lot full of thousands of spent nuclear fuel casks. Nobody's going to take that. I need input from the communities in what they want to see. I need input from the communities and people and what we want to do in the package performance demonstration. I'm trying to lay out a simple vision that everybody understands and everybody can measure progress against. Okay. Let's say we passed CD0, the Atlas Rail Car certified. The next thing we do is we turn to look at the package performance demonstration. We get ready to move the high burn at demo cask. We start to engage with you know, the shutdown reactor sites to see if there's any interest. Right? At the right time, we need to consider re-establishing a dedicated office for the management of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste. Okay. My risks, my risks are communication. Everything I've talked about, I have a $100 million a year program. I have 24 staff. I have six DOE people dedicated to consent-based siting. Communication is everything. <laughs> DOE being seen, seen is everything. I can't achieve that. But Back. We lost you briefly. I'm not sure if you can hear us. And Paul, I think you're on mute. And he lost his screen. Oh, yes, yeah, so I can hear you. Sorry, I'm back now. So, could you put up your slides again, Paul? Yeah, sure. And then put it on present presenter mode, please. Yeah, sure. Hold on. Uh, uh, no. It's kind of ironic you cut out just as you were talking about communications. <laughs> 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 so it makes me laugh. So it's, Can we get said, you I mean, to maximize it, please? Yeah, sure. Could you go into presenter mode, Paul? Yeah, go up to no, 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 the end. Live show or. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Right. So, it's okay. communication. 
hundred million. I have a hundred million dollar program. I have twenty four members of staff. I have six people working on consent based siding. Right. We are holding this together by duct tape and string at the moment to 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 start moving forward. Right. In the last ten years with this program, the schedule slipped seventeen years. Right. There's a risk that we can slip significantly, adding billions to the liability. The other thing I want to stop and explain clearly is, is the schedule we're on. If I open an interim storage facility in 2038 to 2040, and I can move 3,000 tons of spent nuclear fuel a year, it's going to take me 50 years to move the fuel to interim storage. If I start a repository program at some point, from starting a repository program through to actually opening the repository itself is typically 50 years. Then I another 50 years to move the spent nuclear fuel. Then I move the high level waste. Then I move the Navy fuel. Then the repository stays open for a hundred years. The, the schedule for this program is out in 2240, 2260. If this is a multi-generational program from where we sit today. Okay. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act, as it's written, it allows me to move forward. It allows me to start the program going again. It allows you to build the incremental steps, start to build trust, start to build public and political trust as well. At some point, I have to amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. I don't need to do it today. I'm probably looking at about 2026 to 2027 before I really start to push for amendments to the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. But what I want to leave you with is we are moving. We are making progress. We are going to make small controlled steps moving forward. I'm excited. This is a really good news story where we are. Things are really falling in place. So I'll stop here and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Mike? Hi, thank you. Great talk. Um, what are the thoughts on a WIP 2.0? Just looking back, there were two sites that were sort of mm -hmm. uh, being considered for WIP, and one was, one of them was in Kansas. I mean, what? Ignoring Yucca Mountain, is there another WIP that might be possible? You know, t t t remember t t what what EM and NE has have to do is we have to start the process, a consent based siding process, to start looking for that second repository. To begin with, we can do that together. Okay? As we might skip down the garden path together, we can decide whether we're going to stick together and just have one big repository for all the waste moving forwards, or we can decide to separate and have two separate repositories moving forward. But to, to begin with, for the first five years, we have a common vision, common mission to to work. We, we should have a common vision in, to work together. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Paul. It's just a good question, Paul. Uh, by the way, thanks. Talk. Good talk. Um, so for the North Anna uh, instrumented cask, you said you're going to move it in 27 to mm -hmm. where? I'm currently looking at all options. Some of the, so it has to be a national lab. I'm looking at the options for capability, for politics, everything. I have to make a decision before the end of the year. Yeah, well, actually, that's one of the reasons we want to try to keep TAN open at Idaho, but it's, I don't even know if it's still functional because yeah. it was the only place we could do that. But I think it's dead now. Anyway, all right. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thank wow. you. I'd say 60 of the current fleet every year, more and more reactors point to this, this cask to say everything's good. The worst case scenario is. We have to start offloading fuel from dry storage back to wet storage. And there is some room. Yeah. Allison? 
Thanks. Um, thanks a lot, Paul. That was that was fantastic. Um, I'm so glad you're a real breath of fresh air for the this program. It has needed it for years, and I'm really yeah. glad to see you here with all these great ideas. Um, a cup, you know, I have a thousand thoughts, but but um, I'm really glad to hear you say that we need to think about waste from these advanced reactors. Some of us mm -hmm. have actually um, done some research in this area, including. Yeah. Um, the National Academy of Sciences. Oh, yes. I, I've read it, Alison. And mm -hmm. I've read the recent Akram, uh, not Akram, uh, the UK paper, that, which had the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. so, yes. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so yeah. there are there are folks thinking about that. But um, I, I like the idea of exploring a second repository. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, the BRC definitely was interested in that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I think getting funding is always the challenge. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that one of the things that you really can't wait for is fixing the finances associated with nuclear waste disposal in Congress. Yep. That yep. you know needs to get fixed right away because there's a reason that Congress mm -hmm. has not appropriated funds since 2010 for this. Yep. Um, and then, uh, another question about the, moving the North Anna cask, is it actually licensed to be transported? Well, actually, get in the certificate right now. That's part of the work now. Ah, there sh okay. shouldn't be anything stopping us to move it. All right. Because so, okay. you need the NRC to give you that license. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. All right. Good. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. Girls? Yeah, but Paul, thank you very much. Great talk. So um, I was intrigued with some of the stuff you were saying about the international engagement, I think mm -hmm. dealing with workforce. Uh, could you talk a little bit more on that, to some more details, please? Yeah, it, it, as I said, when the Yucca Bandon project actually started, we were the world leaders, right? So Finland, Sweden, everybody used to come to us for advice and, and input. Right? Since 2010, we're, we're an R&D program. We're building new computer models. We, that's all we're doing at the moment, building new computer models for different media. And, and I, I challenged my team. I said, when's enough enough? You know, when do we stop playing computer games? And when do we actually start doing stuff to move forward? So... When I worked with Verano, we used to send about 10 to 12 uh, of our, our best and brightest engineers and their families across to Europe to our facilities for two to three year periods of time to really become immersed in the culture, get the experience, and then bring that back to the US. It didn't work every time, but I'd say 75% of the time, the people that came back were better for it, much better experienced, and really helped to grow our business, right? That's what I want to try and do with some, some of my engineers and scientists. I need the younger people, the bright people, and even some of my, my management team to be able to go across and really get immersed in these projects to really learn how things are getting done not just do paper studies, what happens to be building salt, what happens to be building crystalline rock. No, let them go and actually be involved with trying to site a repository. Let them go to Finland and actually see the stress and, and pain that Possevo is going through right now behind closed doors, trying to get their, their repository over the finish line. That's what I'm trying to get. I want to build confidence in my team so when we are allowed to go one day, I have the capability to do it. Okay. Paul, oh, that's terrific. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, well, we'll see Allison's hand back up. Allison? Yeah, it just strikes me that, um, mm -hmm. you know, and this was the overwhelming yeah. conclusion of the Blue Ribbon Commission, that mm -hmm. the problem in the US is really mm -hmm. a, a political slash social yep. one. And yep. that's really where all the emphasis needs to be. You mm -hmm. don't need to be technically competent because you already are, you ticked that box, box a long time ago. 
Mm -hmm. um, you really need to ramp up on the on the social side. And I know that you guys have put a lot of money into this consent based citing program, but I'm a little skeptical that you're going to get what you really need out of it. You really need to spend time yeah. looking at what Canada, mm -hmm. Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, mm -hmm. etc. even your own country, the UK yeah. have done yeah. and are doing. And it's really just getting out there and talking to people. That's, that's, and doing that's a lot of that socialization. And that's, you know, it takes a team, but it doesn't take a team of engineers. It takes a team mostly of social scientists. This is not, it's not true. rocket science, so. No, no, I 100% I agree with you, Alison. At the moment, my team's 24 people and my travel budget is appalling. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, that, it's that simple. At the moment, as I said, I'm holding this together with duct tape and string and we're making progress. You know, people trust us, people like what we're saying. It's a simple vision we're building trust, but we rapidly have to move to really start to seek host communities to come forward. And then we have to have the capability and people to actually start engaging with them. And at the moment, I don't have that. I don't have the budget to support that. So, but every presentation I give, I lead with the liability table. Have you seen it live from have you seen any lift from what appears to be growing uh, enthusiasm for nuclear energy, especially in light of um, climate change? No, because nobody wants to talk about the waste issues. I'll be honest. Nobody wants to talk about it. You never hear it mentioned. Including the vendors of the new reactor designs. Oh, yeah. That's very true. But if people do talk about it, it's platitudes. That's all you get. Yeah, we'll deal with it. Don't worry about it. But it's here. It's now. We have to deal with it. So, yeah, yeah. the waste already exists. There's plenty of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, I've got to admit, the, the advanced reactor vendors don't like the fact that they're going to have to treat some of this waste. But, but it should be part of the investment decision. As people are looking to invest in these reactors, what are you going to do with the waste? They can't turn them on unless DOE signs an amended standard contract with them. Okay. Yeah, just uh, real quickly, Paul. Uh, as you know, uh, the uh, the uh, NAS committee that Alice and I served on and several others have talked about um, needing to develop a generic repository standard. And yes. I you know, my question is, where are you on that? Because there's been a lot of effort to try to make sure this gets included in administration discussions. Uh, are you guys able to move this forward? So we signed an MOU with EPA. I was strongly supportive of this initiative. So I signed an MOU with EPA, and we've met with EPA several times to say we're ready to su supply them with any information that we have to help them do this. When I, when I go up and behold to talk about my program, I, I tell, tell people who listen to me that, you know, don't just fund me to, to move forward. You have to fund EPA, you have to fund NRC. All the agencies have to move forward together. We have to. We have to be in lockstep to moving forward together. But just to go back to your original question, I am 100% supportive of this EPA generic standard. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your thoughtful comments, and we we wish you the best of luck. Um, we've Thank got you. <laughs> we've got a, a fifteen minute break. We'll return at three o'clock. Thank. You. Uh, we will now hear from Dr. Manuela Buonanno, Assistant Professor of Radiation Oncology at the Center for Radiological Research at Columbia University. Dr. Bonato, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, uh, the organizer, for allowing me to speak today about flash effects with a focus on in vitro studies. So flash effects are 
biological effects that occur when radiation is delivered at very high dose rate. So those are um, effects uh, that occur particularly at normal tissue level because when radiation is delivered at relatively high dose rate, then you um, uh, ensure tumor control. Um, the same tumor control as radiation delivered at conventional dose rates, but with reduced normal tissue to toxicity. That means less uh, long-term effect, less long-term side effects. So the, the sparing uh, uh, effects of flash is really uh, encompass a name for biological effects that are strictly characterized by physics parameters. So in general, in conventional um, radiation therapy, we use um, one uh, several dose fractions that are relatively low, like a couple of gray per fraction that are delivered uh, between one and two gray per minute. So the dose delivery time takes a, a few minutes. In flash instead, um, the doses are relatively higher, like 10 gray or more, and they are delivered very fast at, let's say, uh, I have here 100 gray per second, but I think there might, more might be needed. So in particular for pulse beam, it is very, very important to really set the right parameter to get those sparing effect of flash. So what is the dose rate, mean dose rate, or distant things dose rates? So what is more important, the dose rate in the pulse or the mean instantaneous dose rate? And then what is the time, the total time to deliver the dose and even the frequency between uh, or the time between two pulses? So a few years ago, uh, Mary Catherine Vosinen um, uh, showed these, uh, this graph um, summarizing the, the, all the experiments that were uh, done uh, at, uh, at that time, up to that time. And then she uh, grouped in here all the conditions, the physics uh, conditions to obtain the flash effects. And as you can see, um, um, in order to obtain flash sparing effects of normal tissues using electrons, you really have to deliver the dose at 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth gray per second. For protons, at least for experiments done until, you know, the 2020, 2021, um, the dose rate to obtain to achieve flash uh, effects with protons were about uh, 100, 1,000 gray per second. So uh, the take home mess message is that you really need very high doses. So it all started actually before this experiment that was done by, uh, by uh, Dr. Uh, Wozinen and her group. So, but she, so it was well known that um, the, the deposition of radiation, the, the dose rate or, or the time when the dose is delivered makes a difference at biological level. What you see here is um, lung of mice that were exposed, so both um, bilaterally to a single fraction of 17 gray that were delivered either at low dose rate or very high or relatively high dose rate at 60 gray per second. So over time, as you can see, if the dose was delivered in a like the shorter time, then these mice showed um, fibrosis. For flash, as you can see, even just comparing uh, these immunohistochemistry, this H and stain, you can see that they really look like controls. So you kind of really have to sort of double the dose at these very high dose rate to start seeing some fibrosis. So since then, the flash, um, uh, the flash uh, radiotherapy started to in be very intriguing, not only for the clinicians, but of course for uh, radiobiologists. 
and physicists because uh, the studies of flesh, they pose real challenges for physicists too. But so far, uh, flesh effects, so um, uh, sparing flesh, uh, uh, effects um, were obtained already with electron protons, even with soft X-rays and also with carbon ions using different models uh, or different organs. So they were um, shown to occur in brain, in lung, in skin. And so sparing effects in different type of tissues, normal tissues, but all of these um, uh, radiation types that were, um, were as efficient, they managed to, to, to kill tumors as well. So again, just a very brief summary to show that um, normal tissue is spared by flesh in different organs and in small animals and even larger vertebrae. vertebrae. So the question is, um, it seems that there are like two types of responses, right? So tumors respond to, um, they don't care about the dose rate. They are just killed by radiation regardless of the dose rate that is used. Unlikely, again, normal tissues that seems to be spared when the radiation is delivered super fast. So the tumors are spared as well. So, so far, it has been shown uh, for more than 23 tumor types where uh, there was a comparison of effectiveness using flash versus conventional dose rate. And um, with even some exceptions, uh, uh, in some cases, flash radiation therapy was slightly more effective or was not really effective, particularly for one um, leukemia uh, type. In a human, the, the flash sparing effects were also shown um, in, in 2019. So this first patient had uh, skin metastasis due to melanoma. So he, <laughs> I don't know, maybe he had hundreds of uh, irradiation and treatments before until um, uh, flash uh, radiotherapy was, was proposed. So for this experiment or actually this treatment, he had one, one tumor treated with 15 gray uh, electron flash that were delivered very fast. And they had complete tumor response um, and then no recurrence after, after five months. So there are now in humans um, uh, feasibility studies, actually, that is at the, the Cincinnati uh, Children uh, and um, Proton Therapy Center in Cincinnati with Varian. Um, there is a um, phase, actually phase two trial now to use uh, flash radiotherapy for uh, treating patients. So what are the clinical advantages? Uh, definitely an increase in the therapeutic uh, index, where, of course, if you can push toward the, the right, the complication, the normal tissue complications, but you still keep tumor control at the same dose, then you, know, you get a gain of the therapeutic index that, of course, would mean uh, that you might be able to reduce the dose per fraction or even reduce the number of fractions that people uh, need for, for treatment. So you would reduce treatment time, of course, overall costs, but definitely you would improve the quality of life of patients. But as I was mentioning, there are many ongoing challenges. From the physics standpoint, in beam param parametri parametrization, how to standardize it and what which parameters are the most important to achieve uh, flash effects. And then besides the clinical aspect, what I am interested in uh, mostly and why I think I'm here is about the molecular mechanism. So we don't really know why we are observing these biological effects and why biological effects are so different between uh, normal tissues and tumor tissues. Of course, um, it's not totally surprising that tumor tissues might respond differently to normal tissue um, 
when exposed to radiation. Um, but how these occur or what are the major players for these effects, we still don't know. We don't know the distinctive molecular mechanisms for normal cells and for uh, tumor cells. And those could be totally different, of course. And then whether there are intrinsic determinants at cellular level, if, it's in, if it is the microenvironment uh, uh, that uh, as a whole responds to conventional or flash differently, or it's just at tissue level that this occurs. So this is a slide that summarizes one, um, uh, uh, it's from a paper, one of the recent uh, reviews on the topic from uh, Charlie Dimoli and Mary Catherine Vosinen, looking at uh, the mechanisms of these flash spreading effects and what they think are more plausible mechanisms and maybe more um, unplausible. And we can discuss some of those. But for sure, um, it's um, uh, the redox environment that it's it's very important simply because of the, the biophysical um, uh, rational the, the biophysical processes that occur when ionizing radiation hits a molecule of water. So what it could be different? It's really at the physical and physiochemical step. So whether. Uh, when uh, radiation is delivered at high dose rate versus low dose rate, then maybe the hills of the different radical species that are uh, uh, generated might differ. And whether then if they might differ, they might diffuse or they might react differently. And then um, these um, different yield of radical species and how they interact with each other, then might uh, manifest uh, downstream with different biological uh, responses. So um, why do we care about in vitro studies? Of course, um, it is very important to understand uh, uh, flash effects as a radiotherapy treatment. So using um, uh, small animal models and uh, really um, uh, vertebrates and hopefully patients. But in vitro studies, of course, they are just more practical. So because there are so many parameters that we, 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 we could, you know, if you change one, you maybe you might not get the flash uh, effects, then um, in vitro study can really help to, to give, you know, the simplest conditions to investigate all these molecular mechanisms that are dependent by so many variables. And then uh, I'm gonna show you initial studies that we did uh, in normoxia, uh, which we now know to obtain flash effects, you really need to expose cells uh, under hypoxia. However, the findings that we have in normoxia can be used as a benchmark and for comparison. So again, the redox metabolism is definitely um, the most important um, aspect and uh, the, it has the most important involvement in the response of tumors and normal cells uh, exposed to flesh versus conventional dose rate. However, what is the major player that is under debate? So we started some preclinical studies using cells, and I might show you some very initial studies that we have done with 3D tissues. So um, I work at the Radiological Research Accelerator Facility at Columbia University in New York, where we have two types of irradiator, the proton flash and the electron flash. For the experiments that I'm going to show you, we used proton flash. It's a 4.55 MeV uh, proton beam with the uh, LET of about 10 kV per micron. And the, the drawback is that they are perfect to, <laughs> to traverse cells, but the, their uh, penetration is not that big that at that time we could use it for, um, for small animals, for example, uh, experiments. So, uh, but they are perfectly, uh, they, they traverse all the cells on, on a dish. 
So we look at the acute effect, and uh, what I'm showing here are um, the, the number of gamma H2X foci that are typically associated with um, double strain break induction. So we use normal cells, we expose them to um, different doses of radiation that was delivered at low dose rate at 0.05 gray per second, 100 or even 1,000. And as you can see, particularly at the very high dose, if the dose was delivered at the highest dose rate, then the level of this DNA damage was lower than uh, the, the, the cells that were exposed to the same dose, but at lower dose rate. For a clonogenic survival, there was no much difference, but again, it was mostly because we were exposing the cells under normoxic condition. And then we look at now the uh, involvement of redox metabolism. So we look at senescence in, uh, again, uh, normal cells that were exposed to 20 gray protons that were delivered at different dose rate. And as you can see, one month after exposure, the cells that were exposed to the dose at the highest dose rate, they weren't as as, as, as cells that were exposed to the lower dose rate. And similar um, behavior was, for, was found for TGF-beta-1, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule. So uh, even one month after exposure, um, the cells that were exposed to the dose delivered at the highest dose rate didn't show as much um, uh, induction of this pro-inflammatory molecule. Then um, a very capable um, student came to the lab uh, for, for like a year during the pandemic, and he, he managed to, to pull together a nice story involving um, mitochondria which are, of course, super important when we talk about uh, redox metabolism and how um, radiation um, can, uh, can uh, affect mitochondria. So um, he looked, first of all, at the uh, uh, reactive oxygen species that were uh, generated when cells, again, normal cells, were exposed to 15 gray protons deliver that the uh, relatively low dose rate or high dose rate. You know, 20 gray per minute, it's not really a conventional dose rate. So I will address these as relatively low and relatively high dose rate. And as you can see, the level of reactive oxygen species, when the cells were exposed to the dose delivered at the highest dose rate, then the, the level of uh, generated reactive oxygen species was similar to control. So he looked then at mitochondrial structure. And then after that, I'm going to show you some data on mitochondrial function. So um, Zi Yang, he looked at uh, the structure again of mitochondria. When the cells were exposed to the highest dose rate, this tubular structure around the nucleus of a cell looked very, very similar to uh, the structure of mitochondria of control cells. In here, you can see that they don't bundle uh, nicely anymore. Uh, they kind of group together. And he um, quantified that and showed that the mean mitochondrial length was um, diminished, was reduced, only when the cells were exposed to the lower dose rate. The same, um, and these didn't occur actually in cancer cells. So again, in terms of mitochondrial structure, you start seeing a differential um, response in um, normal cells versus cancer cells and how they do respond to conventional versus flash. Then he looked into mitochondrial dynamics um, focusing on the RP1 protein, which is very important for uh, mitochondrial fission and let's say overall health and function of mitochondria. It also stabilizes P53. Uh, that it's um, uh, uh, and which is actually required uh, for P53 translocation to the mitochondria 
when there is uh, uh, an increase in oxidative stress. So, um, and uh, as you can see, um, when the cells were exposed to 20 uh, to 15 gray uh, protons delivered at the lower dose rate or very high dose rate, then you don't get this translocation um, of uh, P53. And then um, and the, the, the expression of this fission protein is very similar to those of control. So um, instead, in the cells that were exposed to the dose delivered at the lower dose rate, you get this um, uh, uh, translocation of p53, meaning then, meaning then that the cell was under the cell population was under oxidative stress. And then I'll skip these, but it's just to say that he used an inhibitor of the RP1 and he um, reversed all the, the, all that, I, what I showed you about the, 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 uh, the cells, um, like the structure of mitochondria being a bit, a bit better when and uh, or definitely better than cells that were exposed to the same dose at the lower dose rate. So it got uh, completely um, uh, disrupted when using the, um, the inhibitor of this fission protein. Again, showing that mitochondria, well, we know already very well that it's a major player in the response of cells to ionizing radiation, and maybe it plays a very important role in flash exposure as well, uh, for um, particularly for um, normal cells and how they do respond um, uh, to, to this kind of type of dose rate effects. So, um, beside um, structure, we have seen some functions um, and the involvement of the DRP1 protein, fission, mitochondrial fission protein. And then we look now at mitochondrial function. So I would say, um, uh, as, as I, I, I think I uh, said already, um, exposure, of pro exposure of normal cells to protons um, deliver at the highest dose rate really um, um, uh, or actually did not um, uh, resulted in, in uh, uh, sparing effects. And that occurred also if you look at mitochondrial membrane potential, if you look at mitochondrial copy number. So there is no much change to these um, biomarkers if that the, the radiation was, was delivered at the highest dose rate. And then he looked at cellular ATP, extracellular oxygen consumption. So this is to say that mitochondria might play a big role in the response of normal cells to um, uh, dose rate effects. And then I want to show you these um, initial experiments that we did um, in 2018, unfortunately, we couldn't uh, follow up for funding reasons, but um, we use a 3D model of uh, human hair weight. We expose these to uh, 10 gray or 20 gray still protons uh, that were delivered at 0 0.2 gray per second or a thousand gray per second. And then we looked at the expression of um, carbonic hydrase 9, there is uh, an, an enzyme that it's generally associated with hypoxia in many tumor cell lines. But in normal tissue, it is involved in really maintaining and stabilizing the pH of, of for cell survival. So and it's also linked to TGF beta. So again, uh, regardless of the dose, when the dose was delivered at the highest dose rate, you get uh, no really uh, no induction. Uh, the induction of this um, enzyme was no higher than control compared to when the cells were exposed to similar doses, but the lower dose rate, then you get the spike of these uh, carbonic anhydrase 9. So, and this was, yeah, I forgot to say three months after exposure. So something that, um, so uh, effects that you can see in, uh, in, in long term. 
So um, just briefly uh, uh, summarizing what I showed you in cells, normal cells exposed to protons, and again, under amb ambient oxygen tension, uh, flash irradiation uh, does not uh, induce inflammatory responses like conventional radiation does. It does not, not affect mitochondria structure and function. And I didn't show you the data, but even the mode of cell death is different. So um, conventional uh, radiation um, uh, uh, cells die mostly by necrosis when they are exposed to a particular dose delivered at conventional. Necrosis, that is a sort of, you can think of it as a mode of cell death that it's pro-inflammatory. Instead, uh, cells that are exposed to uh, similar doses but delivered at very high dose rate, they mostly die by autophagy slash apoptosis, not, not really necrosis. So all in all, overall, compared to conventional radiation proton flash seems to preserve redox functions in normal cells. Now I know that I haven't told you the, the what's the holy grail and why uh, or what are uh, the, the probable mechanisms for the sparing effects. So this is still under debate. Some people think about uh, tumor hypoxia, uh, whether um, an instantaneous, uh, the delivery of so much energy instantly can really create an, a, a, a moment of transient hypoxia. And so that might lead to a differential, different response in tumor and healthy tissues, simply because, for example, tumor, they already have a very unstable um, uh, redox environment, and they might not be able to cope with extra oxidative stress, or even they have um, more phantom reaction um, uh, re uh, mode of generation of free radicals. However, um, this uh, idea of transient apoxia or oxygen depletion seems um, to uh, doesn't seem to be the case that oxygen depletion might occur after flash, but only after very high doses, like 100 gray. That are not uh, the doses that clinicians are looking after for for radiation therapy treatment. So, other other um, uh, mechanisms that I maybe uh, hinted at are uh, DNA damage, um, senescence, or mitochondria. But again. There are many, uh, many labs trying to, to understand what are the mechanisms uh, underlying the flesh effects, both in, in the normal cells and in tumor cells. So I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I want to tell you what's next in our lab. So we really hope to finally get this grant um, in collaboration with, with the group in, uh, in Sherbrooke in Canada, where we really want to look at the physiochemical steps that occur when you expose cells or tissues to radiation um, at different dose rates. And then whether this change, physiochemical change, might really go, um, might uh, um, uh, explain or give an explanation to the biological uh, responses that we see downstream. And then there is, we have also an ongoing collaboration with Wake Cornell University, where they have developed um, uh, patient-derived organoids. So you have um, normal organoids and breast tissues organoids from the same patient. And the initial idea is to study their response to flesh versus conventional separately. So you we look at normal cells and then breast cancer cells organoids separately, but um, ideally, if we can get an organoid that contains the two, normal tissue and tumor tissue, then we could really look at, the, um, uh, at how the microenvironment as a whole 
uh, would respond to flash and and conventional. That is what really happens uh, when um, you know you try to uh, re reduce or uh, kill a tumor with radiation with all the normal tissue surrounding it. And um, I want to uh, thank uh, all of you for your attention, and I'll, I'll take any question. Thank you, Professor Bonanno. Uh, fascinating uh, results, very interesting. Um, questions from the board? Amy. Oh, yes, Th thank you so much, uh, Manuela. Uh, understand that your research is is focused on on the mechanisms but uh can you tell us a bit about um the developments on the patient side as well you mentioned the the study in cincinnati um other, what about the other ongoing studies so yeah um those are i think the 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 study with the patient with with skin melanoma uh, happened once and it wasn't uh, has been um, repeated so far and um, the the trial that is ongoing in Cincinnati so the the very first phase was related to uh, again still superficial tumor um and um and it was related to reduction of side effects like pain um it was done i think on a cohort of 10 or less than 20 people and the results were very very um uh, promising in terms of uh, the flesh exposure did not exacerbate uh, those uh, those um, side effects. So the phase one, the phase two, actually started this year. So uh, I think we we have still to wait to see uh, the results from from this trial. I am sure many other people and clinicians are putting together more clinical trial using flesh. But um, to be honest, uh, I, I don't know whether um, uh, flash radiotherapy can be used, let's say, if not tomorrow, but in a month or so. Uh, it, we are not ready yet. Yes, Julian, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much. I enjoyed that. I might have missed the... Uh, uh, this, but uh, what happens if you irradiate uh, cells by the two different approaches under anoxic conditions? So yeah, um, it seems that at least well for um, so first of all, when you have uh, two more um, and normal cells, um, they already live in. Uh, uh, not that the ambient oxygen tension, tumor cells or cells in the tumor can be um, hypoxic uh, with, with even different uh, degrees of hypoxia uh, within, within the tumor itself. So it has been shown that flash effects are really dependent on, uh, on the, uh, uh, the level of oxygen and particularly, uh, you know, on cells in culture that can make a big difference when you look at um, um, uh, clonogenic survival. So, you know, when there is, uh, um, when there is oxygen, you have, um, uh, the damage that is, is induced by radiation is fixed. So um, uh, the, the oxygen enhan enhancement ratio can play a role. Uh, but again, um, it, it might depend also on the type of the degree of hypoxia that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Daniel Morrow, uh, program officer. So, um, Manuela, thank you. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about, you cited the LET um, at 10 keV per micron uh, at the start. Was that held constant throughout? Have you looked at varying the LET or comparing it to, I think, other modalities? Sure. Because, yeah, because I'm just wondering, or, you know, even delivering the same dose at different depths or like, 
Uh, just how has that been studied systematically for these yeah. types of... Uh, Daniel, it's, uh, it's a very good question, particularly, you know, when you talk about protons, whether you are um, in the Bragg peak or far away from the Bragg peak. So the answer is no, we didn't look at that systematically and that uh, we weren't, uh, we were outside the Bragg peak. Um, so, yeah, there are people uh, studying um, effects of uh, flash effects when the, the radiation wall is, um, uh, when the dose is delivered at uh, different dose rates at the Bragg peak or outside the Bragg peak. But I don't know, I, I don't recall, to be honest, the results of these experiments. Understood. Thank you. Any questions from those who are online, those board members online? Doesn't look like it. So um, it only remains to say thank you very much for- Thank you for having me. Thank you, Daniel, and everybody for allowing me to present to you today. Thank you. The next presentation is by Mr. Max Postman, who's a foreign affairs specialist at the Office of Material Management and Minimization at the National Nuclear Security Administration. And he's going to be speaking about the status of US and international production of Mali 99 without highly enriched uranium. You have the floor. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to update you here. Um, the board's work on this topic has been really valuable to me, especially when I was coming onto this portfolio. Uh, so it really is an honor to have the opportunity to uh, speak with you here. Um, I'm going to start with a brief background on Molly 99 and NNSA's work in the area. Then I'm going to give you an update on the current status of our domestic and international work. And then finally, I'm going to address the future uh, looking issue of the outlook for Mali supply uh, in the United States. Um, oh, and I'm going to try to do my own slides. All right. Uh, so quick background on Mali. Most of you are probably familiar with the fundamentals here. Uh, so the decay product of Mali 99, technetium 99M, is used in over 40,000 medical procedures in the United States every day. Uh, it's a diagnostic isotope uh, used primarily for diagnosis of heart disease and cancer. Um, historically, the way Molly was primarily produced, at least over the last few decades, is by taking a highly enriched uranium target and irradiating that in a multipurpose research reactor. Now, HEU made a lot of sense from an economic perspective because the more U-235 you have in the target, the more Molly 99 you're going to make. Um, however, HEU is, of course, a proliferation-sensitive nuclear okay. material. Um, Molly has a short half-life, uh, 66 hours. Um, tech has an even shorter half-life of six hours. That's the reason why you're going to hear me talking about Molly this entire time, even though it's tech, which is actually used medically. Given the extremely short half-life of tech, Molly is the isotope that is produced and shipped, and it's only at the end of the uh, supply chain where the tech is milked off. Um, and, and given that short half-life, it is it is impossible to stockpile. So those 40,000 US patients uh, a day are relying on just-in-time delivery. Um, United States uses about half of the global supply, um, but we are reliant on imports. Uh, from 1989 through 2018, we had no domestic production, fully reliant on imported material that was coming from Europe, South Africa, and Australia, um, and in some cases, Canada. Um, for a lot of that time. Um, from 2018 through 2023, we had a uh, small scale Mali production in the United States. Um, and today we, we are back at the point of having no domestic Mali production. And I'm going to talk in more detail about how we got from A to B to C uh, a little later on in the presentation. Um, being reliant on imports is not ideal um, for something that we use so much of and that we can't stockpile especially because the global producers that we're relying on are using production infrastructure that is quite aged. Um, most of the nuclear reactors that are used to irradiate targets to produce Mali 99 are 50 to 60 years old. Um, those reactors are prone to unexpected outages 
those outages very quickly result in shortages that can impact patients, given, again, the impossibility to stockpile. Um, we saw very severe shortages at a global level in the 2009 to 2010 timeframe, and we have seen significant, though shorter-lived shortages since then, most recently at the end of 2022. Um, following those shortages, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Nuclear Energy Agency commissioned a series of studies to understand the root causes of the shortages. And what OECD NEA found was that the, the issues at those reactors that brought them on offline that caused the 2009 to 2010 shortages, those technical mechanical issues were actually a symptom of a broader underlying economic issue. Um, which is that governments had historically subsidized the production of this medical isotope. Those subsidies resulted in artificially low prices. The artificially low prices meant that there is insufficient financial incentive for existing producers to invest in modernizing their production infrastructure and insufficient financial incentive for new companies to break into the market and establish new production facilities. So that results in this sort of perverse situation that we find ourselves in, where we have a vitally important medical isotope, but we're reliant on facilities that are 50 to 60 years old and that are prone to unexpected outages. Uh, domestic production has a lot of advantages. Um, first, uh, because of the short half-life, a significant amount of Molly 99 is lost in transit when you're shipping it across continents. If we're making it here in the United States, we're losing a lot less to decay. It's much more efficient. There's also a lower risk of transportation-related disruptions. Now, those really significant shortages that I talked about were not related to transportation. They were related to production facilities, usually reactors. However, we have seen um, significant, though short-lived, uh, supply chain impacts from transportation issues. Mali is primarily transported on commercial airlines. So when events happen in the world that disrupt global air travel, that also disrupts Mali supply. So we saw that after the attacks of September 11th, um, after the explosion of the Icelandic volcano in 2010, um, and in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the supply chain does a good job finding alternate transportation routes. And so these transportation issues have not caused really extended uh, shortages, but they can have negative short-term impacts. So again, making it in the United States is very beneficial in that it allows us to uh, avoid or mitigate the risk of those kinds of transportation issues. Um, it also results in a more resilient production infrastructure for Mali globally. Um, it will mean we're making more Mali from more different facilities and from a more diverse set of technologies. So almost all of the Mali that is made today is made using targets, uranium targets that are fabricated in a single facility. So if that facility were to experience an issue, you could have very far reaching problems uh, in the Mali supply chain. By contrast, a lot of the newer companies in the US that are working to establish facilities use different technologies um, that are not relying on the same kind of target design and not on that same fabricator. So for example, you saw companies using, for example, liquid uranium targets uh, or targets that don't involve uranium at all. A more technologically diverse uh, supply chain production base has fewer common points of failure, it's more resilient. Uh, lastly, domestic production is valuable in terms of U.S. technology and manufacturing leadership. So, for example, one of the companies NNSA is working with, uh, Shine Technologies, is building a facility to produce Molly 99 in subcritical assemblies that are driven using fusion reactions. So that company has a long-term vision for application of fusion technology to then apply it to other areas, potentially including energy production in the future. Now, from an NNSA perspective, we're really focused on the medical isotope side of that. That's the only side we're financially supporting. But we also recognize there is a long-term positive benefit to developing these kinds of technologies in the United States. So uh, NNSA ends up with two lines of effort related to Molly 99. Uh, the first and the longest standing is the international line of effort. So we have a program to minimize the use of weapons usable nuclear material in civilian applications globally across the board. Uh, and as part of that mission, we've worked with global medical isotope producers to help them modify their production processes so that they can use uh, high assay, low enriched uranium or HALU targets instead of HEU. 
uh, thereby reducing nuclear proliferation risks. Now, following the 2009 to 2010 shortages, Congress passed a piece of legislation called the American Medical Isotopes Production Act, which directed the Secretary of Energy to support domestic production of Molly 99, because at this point we had no domestic production. Given and, and the law further stipulated that production would be without HEU. Given NNSA's experience with non-HEU Molly production technology, we were also given the task of supporting domestic industry. Um, it's certainly a it looks a lot different than most of the work scope in the NNSA portfolio. We don't often work with private U.S. companies, um, but um, it was a good fit given our other experience. And so both of these lines of effort support the common goal of a world with reliable supplies of Molly that are produced without HEU. All right, so with the background covered, I'm gonna to switch to the uh, updates on the domestic and international fronts, uh, starting with international. Um, so I'm very pleased to tell you that um, last year we reached a major milestone uh, with the last major global producer of Molly 99 converting fully from HEU to HALU. That means all four of the major Molly producers around the world are using HALU targets. It also means that 100% of the Molly that is sold in the United States and used in the United States is produced with HALU. Um, there is a very small residual amount of global Molly production that uses HEU targets. That is for local producers that doesn't go on the global market and doesn't come to the United States. That includes Molly produced uh, in countries like uh, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran. Um, this was a very significant nonproliferation achievement. It's something that we highlighted very heavily at the U.S. government level at the recent IAEA International Conference on Nuclear Security, um, fulfilled nuclear security summit commitments. Um, I will note there is some work left to be done in this area. Um, so while all of the major producers are using HALU targets, those targets go in nuclear reactors that have separate nuclear fuel. Now, there are six major reactors that the producers use. Of those reactors, five of them also use HALU fuel, in many cases, thanks to assistance from NNSA to convert the fuel. There is one reactor remaining, which is Belgium's BR2 reactor, which is still using HEU fuel. Um, so the Molly itself is produced from HALU. It's not being produced from HEU, but the neutrons are coming from HEU fuel. Um, we are making great progress in converting that reactor in partnership um, with the Belgians to HALU. They had a very successful test of a HALU fuel assembly uh, in the reactor last year. Um, so within the next couple of years, we'll be able to say that not just is all, not only is all the Molly produced from HALU targets, but the neutrons uh, that irradiate those targets also came out of HALU fuel. Um, on the domestic side, uh, the picture is more mixed. Um, NNSA has provided uh, financial assistance to U.S. companies through competitively awarded uh, cooperative agreements, which is a form of grant. Uh, we've also provided non-proprietary technical support through the national labs and established a program uh, for lease and take back of uranium. Thanks in part to this assistance, U.S. companies have made a lot of progress in establishing the physical infrastructure needed for Mali production. One company, North Star Medical Radioisotopes, uh, established and operated a production line at the Missouri University Research Reactor from 2018 to 2023, um, successfully making Molly and selling it on the U.S. market. Um, that was a relatively small level of production, um, amounting to less than 5% of U.S. demand. Uh, North Star also completed and began commissioning on a second facility in Beloit, Wisconsin, to produce Molly 99 using accelerators. Um, that facility reached the hot commissioning stage. Uh, however, uh, in October of last year, North Star made a business decision to indefinitely suspend their production of Molly 99 um, for profitability reasons. Uh, this was certainly a significant setback for our program. Um, on the infrastructure side, I would also highlight um, the second major company we have supported is Shine Technologies in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, Shine's also made significant progress on the production infrastructure. Um, they are about 75% complete with the facility you see at the bottom there in Janesville, Wisconsin. Uh, that facility, once operational, will have a production capacity uh, that could exceed 85% of U.S. Molly demand. Um, 
However, Shine has also experienced challenges with financing and commercialization. Um, after a lot of success early in the project in securing private investment, um, Shine has experienced challenges in securing the additional private investment needed to get this project across the finish line. As a result of that, uh, the company was forced to lay off a significant portion of their Molly 99 project workforce uh, in August of last year. Um, they have, uh, as a result of that, been forced to suspend construction on the facility, though they do continue long lead equipment procurement, design, and licensing. They are committed to completing this project and remobilizing construction once financing is available to do so. So looking at this, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the cause of these financing and commercialization issues that these companies have experienced? Um, and our view is that this represents a combination of some project-specific challenges and some market-wide challenges. Um, for example, on the North Star side, Northstar used a unique production technology where they were using stable molybdenum targets instead of uranium targets. Now, this has a lot of advantages. It made it uh, quicker for Northstar to establish their production facilities because they didn't need to be irradiating and processing uranium, which meant the facility itself didn't need to go through NRC licensing. Um, that added a lot of technological diversity to the supply chain. Uh, it had much lower waste generation. There's a lot of positives. However, it also results in what's called low specific activity Molly 99. That material, when it's sold to the radio pharmacy, requires a different generator. Um, and so this creates challenges for the customers to adapt to that different generator technology. Um, so that was certainly a factor that made it difficult for Northstar to secure a significant market share. Um, on the Shine front, you know, this is a large first of a kind nuclear construction project, a lot of the work of which was being done during COVID. Um, and so we saw some of the same delays and cost overruns um, that you see in a lot of first of a kind nuclear construction projects. Um, so we have those project specific challenges that are overlaid with those market wide challenges that I talked about earlier in the presentation. Um, that these companies are still attempting to break into a market um, where the Molly 99 that's being produced and sold um, is in general benefiting from government subsidies. Uh, despite a uh, joint declaration that the major co uh, countries involved in Mali production uh, joined on to in the 2015 timeframe, um, we have not yet collectively achieved the goal of transitioning away from government subsidies um, to what's called the full cost recovery model with market-based pricing. Um, that makes it hard for these companies to break into this market when they have uh, are facing artificially low prices um, and the impact of, of foreign government subsidies. So we see those, those two, the market-wide issues and the project-specific issues as combining to create these challenges. So what are we doing about it? There's really a near-term challenge and a longer-term challenge. In the near term, we need to get a Mali production facility built and operating in the United States so we can make the isotope here without HEU. In the longer term, we need to address the structural issues uh, that are making it hard for production of this vital medical isotope to be commercially sustainable. Um, on the near-term side, um, we are benefiting from a, a $50 million appropriation that Congress provided in the FY 2024 budget. That is gonna go a very long way towards getting these facilities funded and built. On the longer term, we NNSA is working with other US government agencies uh, to consider a number of potential policy changes um, that could uh, improve the financial sustainability of Mali production here in the United States. Um, in terms of the outlook on Mali supply, um, I'll start with the positive factors. So first, the conversion of the major producers to HALU is a big positive, uh, not just from a non-proliferation perspective, also from a reliable supply perspective. Um, a global Mali supply chain that was premised on the willingness of the United States to export weapons grade uranium to three different continents is not a sustainable model. Um, and so the transition that we have successfully achieved to HALU um, is, is puts the supply chain on a much more sustainable footing um, and is gonna be a positive in terms of reliable supply. Um, there have been some real improvements uh, since the 2009-2010 shortages in the uh, coordination and the diversification on the supply chain. Uh, the Mali supply chain is doing a much better job now than they were in 2009, coordinating amongst themselves on uh, planned reactor outages, for example, to make sure that if one reactor is down, there's enough other reactors that are planned to be operating to maintain sufficient supply. 
Um, when reactors have unexpected outages, they're doing a good job communicating amongst themselves and with their customers um, about the fact of that outage so that people can help find alternative sources. The supply chains also become a bit more diversified, um, not so much through the construction of new facilities, but rather what we've seen is a couple research reactors that were previously not involved in Molly production have entered the supply chain and become involved. So that gives us some more defense in depth uh, with more reactors involved, um, less chance of uh, outages resulting in shortages. Um, with that said, we are still reliant globally on six reactors, almost all of which are 50 to 60 years old. Um, finally, on the positive side is the new production projects on the horizon. So in addition to the Shine facility, which I've talked about, um, another very significant one is BWXT's project in Canada. So BWXT is a U.S. company, but this project is a Canadian production project. Um, and they are going to be using a can-do power generating reactor uh, to irradiate stable molybdenum targets to produce Molly 99. Um, and they are in the FDA approval stages now. Um, so that project is very far along. Um, it is probably going to be the, uh, the first new production project we're going to see come to market. Uh, there's a number of other projects that are underway overseas as well, um, but I'm not going to walk through those uh, individually. On the negative side, first and foremost, um, the United States today is still entirely reliant on imports for our supply of Molly 99. Um, that's not where we want to be, uh, especially given that um, those imports are coming from reactors that are only getting older. Um, those reactors are 50 to 60 years old, and as they continue to age, uh, the likelihood of unexpected outages can only increase. Um, finally, we still, not we still have not achieved market-based pricing. Um, certainly have not achieved a verifiable system of market-based pricing as the uh, involved countries uh, committed to under that 2015 OECD NEA joint declaration. Um, we have seen renewed interest and focus from the OECD NEA on this issue. Um, and so that is going to facilitate those international discussions that will help us make progress towards that goal. Uh, and it remains a big priority for the United States um, to um, help achieve full implementation of the joint statement that we all signed up for, um, for the transition to full cost recovery and market-based pricing. Uh, finally, just to summarize three key takeaways here. Um, the first is that we have successfully converted all major global producers of Mali from HEU to HALU targets, marking a major non-proliferation milestone. Um, the second is on the domestic front, we have made good progress in establishing production infrastructure, um, but have encountered significant challenges on financing and commercialization. Um, and I've talked about what NNSA is doing in the short and long term uh, to address those challenges. Um, and finally, the domestic Molly production remains very important, um, especially given the aging global supply chain. The need for domestic Molly production has not gone away. Um, if the if the international community had established a new fleet of research reactors over the last 10 years, modern facilities to produce this isotope, this might be a different story, but that isn't the case. We're still working with that same problematic production base that we were 10 years ago, plus or minus a couple changes. Um, and so the need for domestic Molly production does remain very significant. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I have actually a couple questions to start. Uh, first, congratulations with um, successfully transitioning the global supply chain to HALU. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, <clears throat> my questions, I think, are actually related. One was, in 2016, I was on a National Academies committee that was looking at um, the conversion of research reactors from HEU to LEU, but obviously it's a part of this whole question. And our first recommendation was actually somewhat orthogonal to the task, which was that it would be useful to develop a an inventory of national neutron needs mm -hmm. and anticipated sources to meet those needs. Um, that was later expanded informally to a recommendation and maybe the IAEA should look at this on a global basis. Um, but so the question is, 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 is there any progress toward that? And then related to that, um, the, U the U.S. government is one of the largest consumers of healthcare in the world with Medicare and Medicaid and the military. Um, and I imagine could 
actually exert some market influence. And maybe you were allu alluding to this because you did talk about other government partners in pursuit of this, but it's possible we might be able to affect the market in terms of demand for this material and, and how it's manufactured. Thanks so much. Um, on the first question, I'm unfortunately going to have to take that as a as an after action. I'm happy to speak with some colleagues and get back to you. Um, the organization I'm in, you know, we're we're very focused on those reactors that exist that are HEU, getting them converted to HALU. We don't play so much on the demand side, um, but I know my colleagues in Office of Nuclear Energy do. So I will uh, uh, beat the bushes and circle back with you on that one. Um, second, on the U.S. government influence, I agree completely, and um, that's certainly part of how, is a part of the story on how we got to the successful transition to halu um is is leveraging that us government buying power so we saw the um department of health and human services at that time revise the medicare reimbursement rules so that if a hospital is using a dose of tech 99m that was produced without heu they're eligible for a higher uh, reimbursement so that uh, provides a high economic incentive throughout the supply chain for people to adopt the technology. Um, there was also uh, preferential purchasing from the Veterans Administration, which is a purchaser of a significant, though not overwhelming, quantity of, of Mali in the United States. So um, I agree with you completely, and I think those we are certainly looking at that playbook from the HEU to HALU uh, transition as we look at this next step, which is how do we make the transition from fully import-based to a uh, mix of import and domestically produced. Great. Thank you. Amy? Great. Thank you. Uh, so this is a very interesting story uh, coming from the side of overuse of medical radiation exposure. Just to give you my background, I have written about overuse of nuclear medicine tests, particularly cardiac stress tests, uh, and in especially in the U.S. Uh, so I wonder if part of the um, market issue that you're referring to is because use of nuclear medicine tests has actually decreased significantly in the US uh, <clears throat> since Medicare changed their reimbursement policies for cardiac stress tests to try to reduce the amount of overuse. Uh, so I, mean, I don't deny this is an essential medicine for certain purposes. Um, but I'm, I, would, I would take the opposite <laughs> approach to, to what Will was suggesting, is that about this great need or a need for expansion somehow in, in, uh, in the supply. Yeah, so um, I, I would say, first of all, we're certainly not of the view that, that the use of tech in the United States needs to expand. Um, you know, if you look at in particular, the OECD NEA's studies on projected demand, um, and they had a, a great study that came out last October. Um, they project at the global level, fairly modest, close to flat growth in the use of this isotope. So we're not certainly not expecting or looking to achieve some kind of increase in the use in the US. The view is more there is an existing level of demand, and we want to make sure that there is a reliable supply non HU to meet that demand. You know, in terms of how that demand has changed, um, it is it is difficult to get really authoritative data on utilization here, given how commercially close hold a lot of that information is. But I can tell you, based on our discussions with industry partners, um, we certainly hear that there was a significant decrease in use of tech coming out of the 2009 and 2010 shortages. And that was driven by factors. Some of it was there wasn't tech, so people had to find substitutes. And some of the people liked those substitutes and just stuck with them. Um, people also instituted um, more controlled and more efficient use of the isotope. So prior to those shortages, you would see radio pharmacies ordering much more than they needed just so they'd have it on hand because it was very cheap and why not? And when it became less available and more expensive, then they became more targeted of, okay, we're going to order as many doses as we have orders for. Um, so we do believe there was a drop coming out of, of 2010. Um, since that time, you know, we have not seen, haven't seen reports or data on any on a significant decline in tech use in the United States, um, other than the dip that I've described. Um, the information that we have suggests that demand is relatively stable. Um, you know, as you as you look at the outlook for it, um, there are certainly 
there's a subset of procedures where there really does not appear to be any medically viable substitutes. Um, those tend to be some of the smaller volume procedures. And for some of the higher volume procedures, your cardiac stress tests, your cancer imaging, there are medically viable substitutes, but there's big infrastructure challenges in actually adopting those substitutes, right? And that's a lot of that comes down to PET, right? And when we look at PET availability in the United States, when we look at other competing demands for that PET availability, when we talk with our industry stakeholders, um, we do not see a likely scenario where PET or anything else wipes out tech in the near term. So we really believe there is an enduring need for tech in the U.S. medical community. Um, I'm going to the so Society of Nuclear Medicine. Yeah, I, abs yeah. I absolutely agree. So, um, but, and so it's reassuring that you're not advocating necessary for expansion because it did sound a bit like that. Um, so I think the, the decline was not just in use for medical purposes, wasn't just because of um, the unavailability. There was a significant change in CMS's reimbursement policy for using cardiac stress tests, nuclear medicine cardiac stress tests, uh, for low-risk patients. Uh, and so that doesn't, that's not something that requires a, an alternative, right. that that was a decision. And you can look at the Medicare data uh, and see the big, in the big change in use because they wouldn't reimburse anymore because they said that these tests were unnecessary. There's no, there's no, <laughs> then you don't need an alternative. No, I, I understand. But I also, you know, if you go back, for example, October, 20, November 2022, where we had shortages resulting from an unexpected outage of Belgian nuclear reactor. Um, we are, and that was including in the United States. Um, and so despite whatever adjustments have occurred in utilization of the isotope, we are still in a situation today where there is the margin between supply and demand is narrow enough that when a reactor goes down unexpectedly, we end up with shortages. Um, and so the need to make that supply more reliable, to make that supply domestic, we view that as an enduring need. I agree, absolutely. And just to be clear, I take no position on whether we should be using more or less of this, <laughs> only that we should be buying it intelligently. Charles. I, I support Will's position, but I, you know, Amy's point's a great one. Max, thank you very much. It was great presentation, very, very, very thorough and clear. But maybe I miss missed, so one, one, one question I have, maybe I missed it. I don't know if you talked about uh, the source of the HALU. Is it is it coming from uh, downblending from uh, USHU or from other non non US HALU production? Um, so I'm trying to get at are there risks in terms of the HALU, and at the same time, you know we're trying to uh, ramp up use of advanced reactors, yep. small module reactors that almost all of them need HALU. Yep. So that's what kind of one question area, and then the other one is um, maybe it's sort of along the same kind of theme as Amy's question. I'm trying to think about the, whole, the challenge you're facing, the, the companies are facing with the financing and commercialization. So I take it the approach from your program at NSA has been more technology neutral. So you're not dictating, you're not trying to pick winners and losers. You're saying, look, here's $50 million. We're setting these goals. Do, do that per, Molly 99 production without HU. And but we're not going to dictate how you do it. But I'm wondering, <laughs> maybe you know the more traditional approach is one that that might might help address some of these challenges. I, I don't know. Just putting it out there. Just it could be stray voltage, but just the thought. No, those are both great questions. So on Halu, um, the the short answer is in the near and medium term there is not an issue. In the long term, we do need a. HALU production capability in the United States. So to flesh that out a little more, um, the U.S. companies that choose to get HALU, um, uh, they have the option to enter into le lease and take back contracts with NNSA or to buy it outright. That material does come out of our stockpiles in the Office of Defense Nuclear Nonproliferation. These are quantities of material that have been declared excess to weapons needs and are available for non-proliferation programs. And so that's part of our non-proliferation mission is to supply HALU to U.S. companies for non-HU production and also to foreign facilities that have converted from HU to HALU. Um, we don't supply 100% of the foreign facilities, but we supply a lot of it. Um, so we do have... Um, 
We don't. We so we and so that is our top priority in terms of supply is meeting those non-proliferation needs. Um, to the extent that we have material available, we do what we can to support advanced nuclear energy demonstrations, things like that. Um, so we're we are in good shape out to about 2040 for supply of medical isotopes, uh, HALU for medical isotopes. Um, and it's around that date that we're going to need to see. By that point, we would need to have some kind of enrichment capability for an enduring uh, commercial supply. Allison? Um, I don't think I, I, sorry, let me just address his second question and then I'll. Uh, oh, I apologize. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the technology neutral approach, so so absolutely the, the authorizing legislation mandated a technology neutral approach. Um, I would say that we have, as time has gone on, we have funded, I think, about seven different companies at various levels, and there has been a narrowing. We've seen some companies have dropped out um, or have not succeeded, and, and some have stayed in. And so I do think there has been a essentially a selection process, um, and we are down now to a really limited number of companies. Um, and so, again, it's not NNSA making those choices. We didn't look at North Star and Shine and say, we like uranium-based production more than Molly 98-based production, so we're going to terminate North Star and keep going with Shine. North Star gave it their best shot and did not succeed commercially on Molly, so they are out. Shine is still in. Um, uh, yeah. Allison. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, just to piggyback on what you just said, well, that's all good and fine, except we all know that, as you pointed out, these first-of-a-kind nuclear construction facilities always run over in terms of costs. And so there's a risk, and there's clearly a risk in a national security sense here if we really decide that we need this and we need to be producing it domestically. So there's a reason to actually you know, pick some winners uh, or encourage in a, in a certain direction. I'll just put that out there. But my uh, my other question goes back to the source of the HALU for these um, six reactors. Where do they get the HALU from? Do they get it from us? Um, yeah, we are not the sole HALU supplier, but most of the HALU used in reactor fuel and in medical isotope targets is coming from uh, NNSA. Um, and and so, so that's part of it. Yeah, so if we're not the sole supplier, then I imagine the other supplier is Russia? That's correct. And which reactors use the Russian HALU? Um, I, I don't think in a public meeting I can get into that piece of it. I'd have to check on which pieces are, are, are commercial proprietary and which aren't, but I'll, uh, I will check on that one and circle back with you. Great, thank you. Allison, I believe that 2016 report um, goes into that at least a little bit. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Uh, other questions or comments? Michael. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Well, I guess two questions about North Star and Shine. Um, if North Star's, was North Star's technology based on Molly 100? So North Star had two different production technologies. So the one that they operated from 2018 through 2023 took Molly 98, put that in the Missouri University Research Reactor, um, and then got Molly 99. Their second production technology, which got to hot commissioning but wasn't commercialized, took Molly 100 targets, irradiated those with an electron accelerator, and got Molly 99. Uh, yeah, I was involved with that project. When at, I was at Los Alamos demonstrating that the the um, low enriched uranium solutions could be converted to Molly 99. And maybe this is an urban myth, but I I, I remember being told that the the international source of Molly 100 was Russia. So. I mean, that would be just a complication in trying to get a Molly 99 source if all of our Molly 100 is coming from Russia. Is that possibly uh, true? That is that is correct. Um, so um, Russia, um, there are, you know, there are a number of other producers that have been working to stand up Molly 100 production capabilities. Um, but that is definitely a challenge with a Molly 100 based. Uh, if you're using enriched Molly 100, mm -hmm. um, then that is certainly a challenge. So then with Shine, is Shine been sort of on the slow track um, based on accelerator technologies or getting a facility um, up and running and certified? Um, 
Certainly in recent years, the delays they've experienced have been on the nuclear construction side, not the underlying accelerator technology side. Um, you know, we do in the, um, you know, they actually have a functioning accelerator unit um, mm -hmm. in a separate building um, that is that is operational. They've had very successful long duration accelerator tests. Um, so it's, you know, in NSA's view, it is not an underlying technology issue. It's not a show stopping tech issue. It is a first of a kind nuclear project experiencing delays and cost overruns issue. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, another urban myth possibly is like um, small compact accelerators at um, hospitals for, um, you know, using that for a point of care for, for patients. And I, I, again, I don't know if it's an urban myth because I was a chemical engineer on the project, not a physicist. Like direct production of tech rather than going through Molly. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is it is technically possible. Um, it's something that especially would be viable for smaller scale. If you look at maybe foreign countries without a good connection to the supply chain, that that could be an especially promising approach. Um, you know, I think this gets back to the tech neutral approach too, where it, it was an open slate. We certainly, companies that wanted to take that approach certainly could have proposed it to us. Um, we didn't end up receiving any proposals for that, that, that ranked highest on the merit scores that, and it got awarded. Yeah, okay, thanks. Questions or comments? I guess not. Thank you very much. Thank you. So next we will hear from Pat Fitch, and I can amend um, the the title that he's been assigned here in our agenda. Um, since that was produced, Pat's been promoted, so he is no longer the Associate Lab Director for Chemical Earth and Life Sciences, but he is the Deputy Lab Director for Science, Technology, and Engineering at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Thank you very much for being here, Pat. Hey, thanks, Will. Um, so I have a collection of different thoughts around uh, how we characterize dose uh, and radiation. And it's a mixture of the science we've been doing over the years and uh, our, our mission needs, which are not just in the science, but also in how to support our operations. Wait a second here for that to come up. And so if I go through the kinds of missions, and none of these will be a surprise to any of you, where we have uh, needs in this area, there's national security missions, weapons, actinide, R&D, et cetera. And then perhaps key, and I'll come back to this at the end, is our uh, responsibilities in terms of how we help our workforce. And a simple example in this would be when we have a potential exposure and we're worried about excision of tissue and the like, how to properly assess margins and the like. And so these are things that are real world things we deal with. We also, and Max is present, I don't know if Max just left or not. Um, we also produce medical isotopes. And then we have an interest in this whole space just because of the fundamental science. And so I, I'm, I'm not gonna do a, a laundry list of everything we do. I'm, I'm gonna try to build a case and I should give a little bit of background. I had a PhD student years ago when the Department of Energy had a, a low dose radiation program. We studied uh, molecular effects, particular uh, uh, promoters and the uh, demotion of the rate of that transcription based on radiation exposure. And, and kind of in summary, what, what it is I think is different today, and I have some science comments, but perhaps just as important, the overall approach that I assess we're going to need to make a difference in this area. And so what I said a second ago about excision is nicely said by this graph, depending on what you want to assume, completely a change what you would do. It doesn't matter what, what kind of exposure it is, et cetera. And the fact that we don't have this, we get to the lower doses. And I, I do want to flag as I go through our isotope work, our medical isotope work, that that actually is a different problem. And, and because you you know when you create the dose and you know what your background is and you know a bunch of other things that you don't know in the low dose uh, environment, including for workers, that we have a completely different problem to solve and we have to start acknowledging that a little more explicitly. Uh, so if I go back to what Los Alamos did, I wasn't at Los, I've been at Los Alamos five years. Uh, so this predates me. Uh, we had a similar program at, at Lawrence Livermore when I was there. Uh, there's all these interesting effects you can see with low-dose radiation. And the one we've captured here 
is this uh, radio adaptive, you know, my, my buddy cells know I've been exposed to radiation, even though they weren't exposed. And it comes from extra, extracellular fluids and other things that, you know, on the surface, you wouldn't expect to provide this. If you translate that to the organ level, and in some cases, even the whole system level, you find other unusual effects. There's preconditioning where, and I'm probably talking about things you know, preconditioning where it makes you less, uh, uh, makes you more, more uh, uh, susceptible to future radiation and other preconditioning that makes you less susceptible. And so there's a whole competing set of things. And in the background, I think there's some reasons this has been hard to unfurl. Uh, and I want to highlight that, but the, it, it's, um, it's an area where what I want to highlight a bit here is what we've learned scientifically and then come back to the, the worker part, the health side of it. So the lab's been fortunate, even though the Department of Energy has not have a, had a program for a while on this, although they have a small one that just started again. They have some pretty substantial investments. Uh, IARPA invested in a collection of things where we did a comparison across a numerous set of technologies. We've developed artificial organoids, uh, can connect those into systems, and do radiation studies on them. We had a, a fairly sizable internal investment in this. And that started just after I got to the lab. I was complete skeptic based on my previous experience in this space that that, that would result in some really great bio uh, signatures, but doesn't result in something that can translate to understanding uh, bio health. And so as we tried to build the bigger and bigger system to move from these controlled in vitro experiments and organoid experiments and the like, uh, we've had some success trying to combine things. This is a very reductionist approach, different cell types and the like. And we have all kinds of different technologies at every step of this, right? So I'm comparing this, I'm going to say a few words about the DOE program in a second, to what the DOE program had when I exited it and then a few years later when they, when they rolled it down to zero. Every step of this is better done today. The science is better, the engineering is better, the ability to make the measurements is better um, that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, a huge investment makes sense. And I want to keep coming back to that. So what, what else have we learned in the same way? So one is um, in the old days of the low dose program, we had DNA sequencing. This was back when sequencing a few thousand bases was a big deal. Uh, we, we, you know, we finished the human genome. Now a few gigabases of sequence is not a big deal. But we also have uh, these really interesting markers, and I'm, I'm assuming the audience has a mixture of people who know the physics and people who know the biology and some people who, who know both. Um, so I won't dwell on these, I'm just trying to make points that the epigenome where we have these signatures that encase around the double helix, and some of them are inheritable, some of them are not, but many of them track environmental insults and the like. And so we, we've started to uncover, as has the community, a variety of signatures from radiation exposure Again, large dose, pretty easy, pretty straightforward. I'll have some examples of that. Small dose, a little harder. And so this is an example using plants where we clearly saw the epigenetic response was degraded in the plant DNA. Um, and so this is for grasses, 20 gray in this case is our exposure. Uh, we did other studies. Uh, I think this case is... is um, um, using the Sandia accelerator, and we did, uh, instead of uh, the grasses, we had other leaves. But the same type of thing, we're now, rather than looking at the physiological response in the plants, we looked at, could you detect that remotely? So Because in the end, you want to do environmental surveillance. And so we found a change based on spectral images. We looked at uranium and, and high enriched uranium as a stressor. Uh, unfortunately, the stressor is very hard to distinguish from drought response. And so now if you're trying to do this remotely, uh, how do you do this? We, we've done surveillance around quite a few different uh, uh, accelerators, reactors around the country and see these similar signatures. But again, it's very hard to deduce out of that the environmental factors that are from uranium or HEU versus our other factors, including drought. And then I think it was two years ago, but just reported out a few weeks ago the Department of Energy's low dose, uh, Department of Energy Biological Environmental Research commissioned BRAC uh, to look into this again. The report does a, a different and much better job than I did of summarizing the fact that we have uh, a lot of science tools, a lot of technology to throw at the problem that we didn't have 15, 20 years ago when the program ramped down. Um, but there's some, there's some cautions. Uh, and in particular, 
control and calibration of experiments was one of the cautions. And so I, I have a, a, a hypothesis put on the table in a second here, but I did want to partially brag and, and partially to point something out that, you know, we, we do make medical isotopes at, at Los Alamos. One of the programs we're involved in uh, together with multiple other labs, Oak Ridge and Brookhaven in particular, mm -hmm. Is, is creating actinium-225, which has had some absolutely spectacular clinical results. And again, I, I want to contrast this to what we need in low dose. You know, you have a, a patient who has um, metastasized cancer, you administer a dose, you track it over time, you know when you administer the dose, this, this is a well-controlled, you, know, you have a hypothesis and you have a pretty well-characterized H0 as well. And so we're very happy to do this work uh, happy to stay in this thing, but it is different than the low dose and the, it's the contrast I want to do. So so when I now go back to low dose and our responsibility to our workers, we are the plutonium center of excellence. Um, most of the forms of plutonium we work with are not soluble. And so when we have an exposure, it can be very difficult. The chelating agents don't always work. Uh, this is, uh, even if they did work, these are not pleasant things to go through. Uh, they've been assessed as as risky to the person's health, so there actually is a trade-off for someone to make. You know, you certainly don't want to know you have plutonium lodged in your lung, but on the other hand, uh, you don't necessarily want to do these things. So one of the uh, experimental or clinical trials we have queued up is this uh, approach, which is becoming very common across the pharmaceutical industry to use already FDA-approved um, uh, chemicals and, and and other things to see if we can use those in lieu of uh, the previous um, approach with chelating agencies and, and, and lavage. So, so this is one of our, our clinical studies, excuse me. We have a second one queued up, uh, which is largely around how to make the decisions and how that relates then uh, in terms of a patient's decisions together with their, their physician. So, so we're trying to pay attention to what we need from the science to help us manage a very large, very large workforce. I mean, this is several thousand people that work these materials every day. So this brings me to the punchline I've been trying to set up, which is not that complicated, but we have a lot of tools to do biomarker discovery much faster and easier and much clearer at a molecular level than I had 20 years ago when my student and I were working in this area. We have many of the models we need. We have many of the in vitro models, the animal models, et cetera. But discovering biomarkers is just the beginning, and this is where I think we have some opportunities. If I look at this strictly mathematically and say, what, what's the challenge? We have a very complicated covariance matrix in our null hypothesis. And so if we approach this by trying to characterize the null hypothesis, which you have to do to make progress in this field, I don't know how much progress we'll make. And we have nonlinear relationships. So traditional approaches are not gonna be very helpful. That, that's all bad news. I didn't come here to deliver bad news. The good news, and we have examples of this that have tremendous parallels, is that some of the tools for machine learning and artificial intelligence have performed exceptionally well in the very similar situations where you have a not so well char characterized, but sense of what your target is. You can build a model of it. You have very poor characterization of your H H0 covariance matrix. However, you have plenty of data. And a simple example from this is seismic predictions. We have uh, examples where for decades, people have looked at the same kind of seismic signatures and not been able to predict when an earthquake, um, a slip fault in particular would start to begin. One of our scientists four years ago looked at that and said, well, what if we had a simple model? If we could train on that, if we could train in, 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 a, in a controlled experimental environment, this would be the you know, geoscience version of an in vitro experiment. And then let's take it to the field and lo and behold, not only did it, was it predictive, but it could uncover much smaller earthquakes in these signatures where if you looked at it, including using the best signal processing we had, you just said it was only noise. And then after time, you get your covariance matrix, the, the neural network version of a covariance matrix tuned up and you start to be able to see these signatures. I, I think a similar campaign, if, if we as an institution at least are gonna wade back into this space on behalf of trying to be good stewards for our employees, I think we need a different approach that includes some of these better ways of characterizing our background signatures. And that's that's what I came to talk about. So, thanks. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments? A 
Okay. Oh, Charles. I know we, Mike Daniel, had a preparatory call with with Pat some weeks ago. So I know maybe I'll ask the self serving question, Pat. Like how how can how can we how can our board uh, help help you? How can National Academies help you continue th that work or or you know and advise uh, help with the guys? Yeah, so program. I think there's several areas where this board and the academies writ large have already started to weigh in or have actually weighed in. Um, so there's uh, you know independent assessments of what the BRAC has said about is mm -hmm. there value in a returning to a low dose program. I, I think. Um, my, I'll speak for myself, not by half the institution. I think we we would like I would like to see a strong bias towards pragmatic utility towards informing, you know, the human health aspects of that. And even though BER you know focuses basic science, I think that could still be biased in that direction. In particular, uh, again, they, they wouldn't say it this way in their report, and they don't say it as a covariance matrix for the null hypothesis. But that's a very simple way, in my mind, of summarizing what's been hard to do in the past. I think the uh, what Max and others have presented, and we have the uh, longer term, and this is big, bigger than the point I was trying to make today, but we, we have a, an aging infrastructure, the larger facilities within DOE writ large, NNSA as well. Um, and they touch lots of different things. The accelerator we use to make most of those isotopes in support of the medical missions, you know, is 50 plus years old. Um, it has other, key um, missions that support NNSA, um, you know, in the end, these large old facilities, I, I as ALD, I owned, I think the, the largest number of square feet of facilities more than 50 years old at Los Alamos. So I'm painfully aware of how hard it is to run them. Um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's not a neglect, but I think pointing out that some of these facilities, and as you're going along and getting your, your value to the weapons program or other programs in NSA, the marginal cost to getting benefits to things like medical isotopes is not that large. It's not another five hundred million dollars. It's measured in tens of millions. And so I think looking if the if this board and the academies can look around the complex and say, in addition to the core mission drivers, so we we rightfully I think are going to have to focus on the core drivers, right? Where the department is not expecting to get billions of dollars of infrastructure investment uh, on top of what they already have, and so these finding uh, ways to accomplish multiple goals for the investments we are going to make. I think that's another space that would be useful to to look at. And again, the, the, I'd start with the larger, more expensive and older facilities. And then the, the, the thing I ended on, which for me has become, I worked in AI years ago before the last AI winter. Um, I find it fascinating where we're at right now with AI. It's in my mind, as a minimum, it's a, a set of tools that it may not come and take my job, uh, but someone who's using it will come and take my job um, <laughs> if I don't use it too. And so, so I think that's another area where the lesson to me isn't about uh, adapting and adopting AI because that's a have to do, uh, and, and includes in operations. It's really around the lesson of how uh, you know. Innovation at scale is something I think we've gotten a little too comfortable not doing. We, we, we the, the, the R&D complex of the United States. So we, we're running a Vannevar Bush model, in my opinion, of, hmm. you know, we have the following kind of research and that leads to the following kind of development, that leads to the following kind of thing. And what we're seeing is this open innovation model, which I think what Professor Berkeley calls it. There's lots of ways. We used to call it pre-competitive R&D, but where everyone gets together, doesn't matter if we're competitors in, mm -hmm. for the for-profit sector or whether from universities or national labs, we all get together and we, we're innovating, innovating, innovating. People have their off-ramps. If you're in the industry, it's to monetize it. If you're in the national labs, maybe supply it to national security. And if you're in the academic sector, it's to further your, your fundamental understanding of, of scientific principles. I think that doing that at scale and at pace is something we, we have kind of not, we've gotten used to seeing where we're falling behind and playing catch up. And so I think we need a fair, fair um, look at what innovation could mean for the country and how that may be different than the old, the Vannevar Bush model. So those would be my three, mm -hmm. three-ish things. They're all small little ass, I know. It's... Innovation, so I mean, if you ask me what the number one word is in my taking my new job that I'm trying to 
get our lab to do. It's it's to how to take our portfolio and get a bigger wedge towards innovation. Not everything, we can't do everything this way. There's things that have to be done conservatively in the same old way, but to try to, you know, get that wedge of innovation much bigger than it's been the last mm -hmm. 10, 10 years. All right, well, thank you very much. I think that concludes um, the public session and the, we will pick things up again tomorrow, uh, breakfast at 8.30, closed session at nine o'clock and uh, for board members, and staff, there is a working dinner this evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. <laughs>